morning, everyone. I'm Travis Plunkett, and I direct Pew, the Pew Charitable Trust's Family Economic Stability Portfolio. Whether you are joining us here at the Pew offices or online, and we're expecting 200 people tuning into the webinar, I would like to welcome you to our discussion. Is student debt deferring the American dream? We brought together a diverse group of experts today to do a deep dive on student loan repayment. What are the problems? Which borrowers are struggling the most? What policy options have been put in place to help them? And what more needs to be done? What we won't be doing today is debating whether we have a student debt crisis. That is, that the amount of student debt, aggregate debt, held by Americans is a serious problem. This is because a number of experts, including some you will hear from today, have demonstrated that most borrowers are successfully repaying their loans, despite the fact that student loan debt has grown from $600 billion in 2006 to around $1.3 trillion today. Moreover, on average, Americans individually carry debt loads that are comparable to or even less than those in countries where repayment problems are virtually non-existent. However, there are a substantial number of borrowers who are struggling to repay their loans. According to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, roughly 10 million Americans, 25% of borrowers, are delinquent on their loans or in default. The borrowers who are having the most difficulty are those who owe the least. According to the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, about 70% of borrowers and 75% of those who are severely delinquent have loan balances of less than $25,000. The consequences of not repaying student loans are more severe than for other forms of credit. Loan repayment problems can affect not just access to and the cost of credit, but also to rental housing, auto or home insurance, and employment. Borrowers in default on federal loans can't enlist in the military, get a security clearance, become a federal employee or a contractor, or receive credit from the federal housing or small business administrations. Many state and local governments have similar restrictions. Moreover, um, directly issued federal loans and private loans are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. And some research has found that student debt may cause households to postpone major life decisions like marriage or delay or forestall steps that help build assets like home ownership. What we have then in the United States is a student loan repayment crisis. As a result, our focus today is on the repayment system itself and the role it often plays in turning manageable levels of debt into serious financial problems for some borrowers as I said, a significant number of borrowers. This isn't to say that there aren't other significant factors that can drag down borrowers' chances of success in repaying loans, such as a failure to complete college, increasing higher education costs, or attendance at certain for-profit schools. Several of our panelists are going to address these issues. Our major theme, though, is going to be loan repayment. Panel one will identify problems with the current repayment system. Panel two will take a deeper look beneath the headlines and identify the groups of borrowers who are struggling the most to repay those loans. Panel three will focus on policy solutions to address the issues and help the borrowers identified in the first two panels. This discussion comes at a very important time for student lending policy. Over the last few years, the Obama administration has implemented a number of changes to the repayment system. As a result, for example, more borrowers are enrolling in income-driven repayment programs. We'll hear a lot about that today. The Senate and House will likely debate additional policy changes in the next congressional session as part of discussions about renewing the Higher Education Act. Additionally, both the Department of Education and the CFPB are considering regulatory changes that would affect loan servicing. Oh, um, and by the way, we. We'll have a new president next year who may have something to say on this matter. Our goal today then is to highlight both the areas of agreement and of disagreement, what needs to be done or not to help borrowers at greatest risk of delinquency and default, and to flag areas that are ripe for further policy research. Before we ask the first panel to get started, 
I have a few other brief items. I'd like to mention that the Family Economic Stability uh, portfolio is only one of the Pew teams that's dealing with issues related to educational debt. The other is our fiscal federalism team, which is examining the relative roles that the federal government and the states have played in funding higher education in recent years. They published a chart book that provides a broad overview of federal and state investments in higher education that's on the flash drive you've received. And they'll release several reports in the future, including an examination of federal and state use of tax incentives to support higher education. One important housekeeping note, uh, the bathrooms are near the elevator banks right over here. The men's room is on the near side, the women's room on the far side. And finally, we're live tweeting this event and we'd love for you to participate in the online dialogue. The hashtag is PewFamFinance, that's P-E-W-F-A-M Finance. For those of you watching online, you can submit questions to the panelists at Mobility events at pewtrusts.org. Okay, now I'd like to ask the first panel to come up. And as they come up, um, let me introduce our moderator, Danielle Douglas Gabriel, who covers student debt issues for the Washington Post. She's a recipient of fellowships from the Donald Reynolds Journalism Institute and Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. Given her wide range of expertise on these issues, we're thrilled to have her with us today. Please welcome our first panel, and Danielle. <laughs> Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Good morning. Excellent, excellent. So I'm very happy to have this esteemed panel here today. I think we're going to have a really lively debate about repayment structure and what's working, what's not. So the first thing I'd like all of you to give me a sense of what are the most important things you want people to understand about the repayment system. OK. So I think we um, uh, are worried about the repayment system because we're worried about borrowers in default and in distress, as we were, as we just heard from, from Travis. And so I think what I would like to um, get us focused on is to have a person in mind when we're thinking about what problems could occur with the repayment system. Um, and the main thing to think about is to erase yourselves from your image of who um, the typical uh, borrower in distress is. So. Um, uh, erase from your mind the image of a Yale or an NYU or a Columbia graduate as somebody who is in distress. Their um, uh, default rates are vanishingly low. People with graduate degrees, very low um, uh, default rates. In fact, anybody who graduates with a BA is, is quite unlikely to default. Um, uh, at the selective institutions, 5% is what it looks like. Grad students, 5 or 6% is the default rate. Um, so um, uh, uh, the face of loan distress instead is a dropout from a non-selective college. Um, that is what the modal uh, person in um, uh, distress is, uh, uh, looks like. Person who spent a year or two at a for-profit college um, or a community college or maybe a non-selective four-year college. First generation college students grew up poor, um, uh, especially during the recession, may have entered college during their 20s or 30s, not a traditional age college student, to, uh, to improve their job market skills. All of this is based on uh, data 
um, that we now have compiled from um, the, the Department of Education combined with data from the IRS, uh, and it very clearly lays out this picture. They borrow very little in part because they dropped out quickly. Right? So they dropped out after one semester or maybe two. Um, they entered with very low earnings and exited with very low earnings, eighteen dollars to $20,000 a year uh, as a typical debt um, for these folks uh, who were in default. And the typical loan in default is for less than $10,000 a year. Okay, it's not, not a year, it's for less than $10,000. You know, the debt, overall debt of people who are in default is less than, uh, the median debt is less than $10,000. Okay, so just take out of your mind the people with $100,000 in debt, those are not the face of, of default um, uh, in the U.S. So um, uh, uh, we're going to talk a lot about what the problems with the repayment system are, and I wanted to sort of get that picture in your mind because you shouldn't be thinking, well, I don't have that problem with the repayment system. Um, I've gone through the process and I've, you know, negotiated IBR, for example, and I've negotiated um, switching from servicers and that sort of thing. You're not the people having problems. Um, I'm not the person having a problem. Um, uh, so uh, uh, um, when we think about um, people's ability, say, to navigate through the income-based repayment program, uh, which relies on... Um, uh, uh, tax forms and your previous year's earnings. Think about somebody who works at Walmart and their hours are changing from week to week because the scheduling changes from week to week. Their payments are not changing from week to week because that's not how IBR is set up. IBR is not set up in such a way that it can handle the high frequency shifts in earnings that low wage workers in the United States face. That's the kind of detail that I think you would miss. You know, I think what we have right now is a payment system that is built for well-paid graduates with stable jobs, right? Who occasionally, when they're younger, they might be sort of ramping up uh, in their careers, but from year to year, their, their earnings are relatively predictable. And that is not who is having the problem in our system right now. Uh, those points are incredibly important, and I think the way we about the student debt itself and the way we think about and design repayment programs are very much... Is your mic on? It's not. Is this better? Okay, okay. It's not on all the time. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay, so um, I think that we need to think... Um, we're talking about repayment, but it's very difficult to talk about the problems with the repayment system and how to fix them without thinking about the larger context of the student debt problem because many of the misperceptions about student debt lead to ideas about how we should change the repayment system that are both um, inappropriate and likely to cause real problems. So because people think everybody is drowning in debt and particularly recent you know, young people, this generation is drowning in debt. That means what people propose is things like let's forgive all student debt or basically let's minimize the amount everybody has to, to repay. So you see the recent changes to the income driven repayment plans that we keep lowering the percentage of your income you have to pay. We keep lowering the amount of time before your debt is forgiven. And there's no question but that we're going to end up forgiving a lot of debt for people who are not actually the people who need to have their debt forgiven. And what's going to happen is that all those people Sue is talking about will not be helped by the system because it will have been designed to solve different problems. So we need to, first of all, think about how to prevent a lot of these people from getting into this situation so we don't design programs to help them. I just listened to NPR talk about somebody who graduated from a public university with $100,000 in debt and talk at length about this person's situation. And we all know how rare that is, and we all know that we could have told him in advance that he should not borrow $100,000 to go to this institution. There are all kinds of debt in our society that people struggle with, and for some reason, you don't see big movements about forgiving the debt of people who have medical debt or people who've gotten into trouble with the criminal justice system and can't pay a small fine and owe lots of money. So we need to keep that on the table as we think about what we do for student debt so it doesn't get out of proportion. And I think that when we look at some of the proposals, it surprises me how much the community of people developing proposals for repayment have sort of bought into this idea that we should minimize everyone's payments. One of the proposals that, that emerges from, from Sue's comments is let's have payroll uh, withholding so that automatically your payments adjust and, 
And so that this becomes, obviously, part of this is to make it a priority, right? But almost everybody who makes this proposal wants people to be able to opt out of it. And if you can opt out of it without, you know, in a just simple way, obviously there have to be exceptions, but if you could just opt out of it in a simple way, then all those people who actually don't put a priority on it and would rather use the money for something else, that's almost everybody, would, uh, will opt out. And then the system isn't going to work. So we need to make thoughtful choices about how to design the system. And to do that, we need to understand who's in trouble, why they're in trouble, and what the appropriate fixes are. Um, oh, I'm on too. Okay. Uh, so, just to, to set a little bit of context from the, the question of our panel, which is why are some borrowers struggling to repay? Um, I think I came up with, from my experience, and for those of you who, who don't know me, I've been working with low income borrowers um, for a long time. <laughs> so, uh, and, and all through legal aid legal aid clients and um, I think that we we have we run the danger sometimes of oversimplifying what the reasons why borrowers are struggling to repay and and we need more data and information about the why I think you know what what um, what we've heard so far is important sort of in terms of what the actual data is so I think um, I came up with four at least reasons that I think of that um, from my experience and also to some extent from the data that's out there and it's really a combination <clears throat> excuse me First, might seem t completely obvious, but uh, a lot of borrowers are struggling because they can't afford their payments. Um, and I want to put that in context, too, that most, almost everybody I see who's struggling with student loan payments is also struggling with some other kind of financial problem. I think it's important because we all work in student loan areas, and sometimes we forget <laughs> that these are whole people who also need cars to get to work and all sorts of other things that they're struggling with. Um, another really important point is that uh, what I consider really is an enforceability issue, and, and anyone who's following the for-profit sector recently, and unfortunately, I've been following it and working with borrowers who have attended those schools for a long time, also knows that it's not a matter of, I think sometimes it's described as people who don't want to pay. Um, I put it in the category of people who have legal rights not to pay. Um, so that's another category. Um, and then there's what, I, what, what we get, gets a lot of attention, but it's a problem, which is people don't know about the options. Um, and sometimes that's an outreach issue, um, but sometimes it's also, and I hope we, we're going to talk about this today, um, there are entities out there who are supposed to help borrowers know about their options, the servicers, <coughs> collectors if they're already in default, and others. Some of them um, do a good job, some of them don't, but there's inconsistency um, all the way around, so I think that's an issue too. And then lastly, people the way the system is set up right now, and I would say it doesn't have to be this way, is that if somebody gets into trouble for whatever reason, goes into default or even late stage delinquency, it is really hard to start over again the way that we've set up the system. And the extreme consequences that happen to people, the earned income tax credits, everything that would, it would enable most people to get a fresh start, sort of prevent that from happening. So those are, those are the kind of four reasons. And remember, it's, re it's always a combination of all of those, or not always, but almost always. Um, and the last thing I want to say is, as we talk about this today and putting in context what we've heard already, I want to make sure that even though my focus has always been working with low-income borrowers, but I feel like sometimes we look at this problem too much as sort of a binary, you know, the low-income borrowers are the ones with problems, and then the sort of higher income or the folks who went to the four-year schools have no problems. Um, and I, I know that's not what, what you all are saying, but I want to make sure we know that uh, a lot of people are struggling in both sides or in all the sides. It's just often the struggles or the solutions are different. Um, so I just want to sort of make that, that point, too. So here's the problem being last, is that I want to respond to everything you said, because <laughs> they're all such good <clears throat> comments. And I think what's so important about this panel and what's so important about what's going on here today is to be able to talk about, sort of demysticize what's going on in the student loan area. Student loans serve a lot of purposes. It's a big program, lots of higher education, lots of different schools. And what's really important is to be able to put the facts out there, the data out there, and I think you know these panelists here are so great at doing that, and I really appreciate that the efforts that they've been doing, because it's so critical 
to understand the issues to be able to design the right solutions. And, and Deanne's right, different solutions for different, different people. IDR is an incredible program for some borrowers. It, it, it is, we did a survey of, I, I'm going completely off script now. Mm -hmm. We did a survey of IDR borrowers um, last year and we asked them how important is it to you to have IDR and on a scale of one to 10, nobody answered lower than seven. So these are critical problems, but what, are these, what is this program serving? Is it a transition from leaving school to matching your income later? Is it, are you gonna stay in for, until you get your loans forgiven? Or, or how are you using this program? A third said, I just need it now, I'm gonna get out as soon as I can and pay off my debt. A third said, I'm gonna stay until I get forgiven. And another third said, I have no idea. So that's, I mean, that's, IDR is serving a lot of purposes. So I just want to put, you know, we started at the beginning here. I just went, there was some, um, at the opening comments, talked about the repayment crisis. And while I firmly believe there are people in crisis and there are groups of people that we're going to talk about more that have crises, I don't think that there's a student loan crisis. I don't think that there's a repayment crisis. We've seen a steady decline in serious delinquencies since the peak of the recession. Um, in, in the last three years, it's declined 22%. And, and for those borrowers entering default, we're getting more information from the Department of Education. I think that's critical. But in the last three years, people entering default in the direct loan program has declined 31%. Still too many people entering default, but it, has, it, is, it is declining. And why is that? First reason, obviously, is employment is better. People who left school in the height of the recession suffered great distress. Delinquency, serious delinquency rates were three times the size of those who left school in 2015. Three times, 22% versus 7%. So people entering today are able to get jobs and are better able to manage their debt. Um, the second reason is I think, you know, I, 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 there are issues in servicing, obviously, but competition in servicing does work. I mean, we have multiple servicers who are competing to do on the incentives that they have, and, um, and, and particularly those performance incentives around delinquency and default are, are critical, although I think they could be improved. And they have been improved. They've been targeting graduates versus non-graduates. But I think you know, school type, as we are going to discuss and have discussed, is a big, is a big deal. The curses are targeting the resources to the bar's most. And now they see their servicer as uh, of not completing their programs, asking them to pay, pay for it. It really doesn't matter that virtually every communication we send them, once they leave school, through entering repayment, and we send out 170 million communications every year to borrowers promoting income-driven repayment. So it doesn't matter that we're sending communications. It's, it's essentially that, you know, and that they have disengaged from their college, they have other issues going on, and they have disengaged from us. And so our challenge is reaching those borrowers. There is one thing that virtually eliminates default, and that's contact. Either logging into their accounts or talking to their servicer. Doesn't eliminate everything, but nine out of 10 past two federal student loan borrowers that we talk to will not default. Conversely, 90% of the borrowers who do default have never talked to us, not responded to any of our outreach, and it's not because we haven't tried. We tr reach out for, to default on a student loan, it takes 360 days of non-payment before it gets transferred to the department's collection system. And in that time, we've tried to reach a borrow 230 to 300 times, almost once a day, through letters, <coughs> texts, emails, phone calls. We don't do it the same way for all borrowers. A borrower with a high FICO score, graduated, getting close to the 90 day, is gonna respond very, very differently than a borrower who has dropped out and disengaged. So what makes, you know, what makes somebody answer the phone? Well, we got this tweet that I wanna read and then I'm gonna wrap up so we can move on to questions, but um, we got our tweet from Monica. Monica re tweeted recently, Finally answered the phone. I really love this. Finally answered the phone. 
first, I just want to caveat, we don't do this, all right? But finally answer the phone after 2,228,868,299,250 attempts to reach me, and they finally had some good news. Smiley face with tears. So um, I'm really glad Monica answered the phone. And lots do, but our task is to keep thinking about how to reach people like her. And, you know, is it, you know, changing the subject in the email, uh, having a different voicemail message. We need to have servicing in incentives that lay out standards, but also allow servicers to use analytics and innovation to keep piloting ways to reach borrowers like Monica. So that's... I'd like us to talk a little bit more about kind of the structure of servicing and that we discuss some of the incentives and perhaps changing the structures. I'm hoping that you can all tell me a little bit about what would make the service, current servicing system a little bit easier for the two categories of people who are struggling with their debt um, to be able to navigate the system. What are we not doing now that we could be doing or what, what could the federal government do to encourage or, or help servicers in this overall um, struggle to get people to, to be current on their loan. Anyone can take that. <clears throat> I'm Are you happy to start. <laughs> yeah. And just, just to, and Sarah's heard me say this before, so, but not everyone has, but I, it, it drives me a little crazy that the servicers focus so much on contact um, because I agree that contact's important. But what I do, and I don't have a scientific number of how many bars I work with. As I said, I've been working with them for a long time, so it's a lot of people. When I'm representing someone, I am in contact with the servicer on behalf of that client, and we have still so much inconsistency and problems when we're actually in touch with the servicer. So even though contact is important, um, I feel like this idea that if only we could get contact, then everything is okay. Um, so what I'm going to focus on in terms of reform is not so much on the contact part, um, and others can <clears throat> talk more about that, but once there is contact, to make sure that it's a quality interaction and the borrowers get the accurate information and they get into the program that they're entitled to and they get comprehensive counseling. So that means that we don't start right away with we're assuming you know, that you're going to have this particular option. We're assuming that you actually owe the debt. And unfortunately for a lot of our clients, actually, like I said earlier, they have a legal right to discharge the debt or um, not even necessarily get into the repayment side. So um, in terms of reform, um, and first of all, I think that servicers can do this. Um, collectors, the post default is, is another story, but we'll start with servicers. Um, that they can do a good job. It's not that everything is so complicated that it's not possible. Um, the first thing is to get the incentives lined up properly, as Sarah also mentioned, um, so that actually there's, um, we find that the incentives really do drive the behavior, and that may not be, you know, shocking that money talks or whatever the, um, the term is, but it is what happens a lot of the time, and so if that we can get <clears throat> proper incentives, then that helps a lot, and also that they're adequately compensated so that they have the time to spend and they're, you know, with the borrowers that's required. It's difficult to do a good servicing job and the at-risk borrowers are often the ones that need the most time. Um, and then the other thing that we really need is consistent standards. Um, right now we have a system, at least on the direct loan side, that's a high level sort of pres uh, not prescriptive way of saying, you know, just kind of compete with each other and everything will sort of rise to the top. That's an oversimplification, but that's kind of the way it is. Um, so you want to balance that, not necessarily being so prescriptive that everyone's hands are tied, but being prescriptive enough that there's a set of public, transparent standards that we know about, that borrowers know about, that the servicers have accountability if they don't, fo if they don't follow. Um, and that would include accountability, meaning that borrowers have some recourse if they don't follow. Um, so that's at least, uh, none of that exists right now, really. Um, there's not a set of enforceable standards. So that's a way to get started with servicing. Well, so I pick up a, a thread from, um, uh, about the consistency that you, that you just mentioned. Um, you know, this is a, a, an enormous government program. Uh, and it's comparable, I think of it as like Social Security. You know, Social Security, our older selves 
borrow from our younger selves, essentially, right? So we put money away while we're working, uh, and then our older selves live off of it. This is kind of the reverse. You know, we're borrowing from our older selves to go to college. Um, we don't have competition among servicers for Social Security. You know, we don't have um, different companies uh, taking care of our Social Security payments, and you find out that, you know, oh, somebody else is in charge of your Social Security accounts this year, and you need to um, uh, change all of your accounts because there's been a shift, and you better find out which website you need to go to in order to contact the person who's getting you, the, the company that's taking care of your Social Security this year. I don't think, honestly, that the, the, the um, servicers should uh, um, be varying as much as they do, should have as much latitude as they do. Uh, I think they should basically be implementing a fairly strict uh, set of, of government policies, and it should be invisible to the borrower who is handling their loan. Um, uh, uh, I like Sarah very much. I think the servicers are a vestigial tail of our system, right? So they're left over from a time when the banks um, actually made the loans. Um, uh, it was still largely a public system um, uh, as it is now, but the banks at least used to sort of own the loans. The government guaranteed them, but the banks owned the loans and they serviced the loans. Now they don't own the loans, but as sort of a political bone, they got the servicing. Um, uh, uh, and I, I, I really think that the best way for all this to work is if the servicers didn't exist. Uh, and we were running this as a payroll deduction system, as many countries do successfully, right? So Uncle Sam has no problem finding us when it's time to do our FICA deductions, our Medicare deductions. It's just automatic. And there is absolutely no way to have a payment system that automatically flexes with our earnings unless it is through a payroll deduction system. The payroll deduction system also automatically with, with, a, with a set aside, you know, we don't, people have to pay zero before, below a certain cutoff. It automatically preferences your food and your rent if your earnings get low enough because the payments automatically go to zero. Right now, if you get a hit to your income, you're on the hook until you go through the process of getting documentation to the servicer that you've had a hit to your income. Until then, the bills keep coming. So under a payroll deduction system, the, the default would be that if your earnings drop, you're not paying. That's not how it is right now. And really, I mean, I've sort of racked my brain about how, and many others have as well, how can we do this without doing it through payroll deduction? And it's basically not doable. I know Sarah wants to respond. Yeah, I was about to say it. <laughs> Go around. <laughs> Maybe I don't. <laughs> <laughs> the context for this conversation is really important because we do need to, under the current circumstances, fix the bureaucratic problems and the approaches. But obviously, just taking that as a given, is a terrific problem. I mean, so much of the problem is how do you get information about which program to go into and this and that. And it seems really clear that the solution to the problem is to automatically put people into this income-driven repayment program so that that just eliminates a lot of the issues we're dealing with. We will still have problems, but then we can focus on the problems that we solve. So Sarah, I can imagine I? you want to respond. <laughs> so, so let's just start with we have 43 million student loan borrowers today. And that's a system that exists. And income driven is certainly something we could debate and go forward at having a payroll deduction and whether that's a good idea or not. But, but, but today we have the system we have today. And, and um, I would, I would uh, you know, I do agree we are the tail. The decision <laughs> to borrow is um, the decision on how much people can borrow and what rates they pay is, is decided by Congress. How much people are going to pay for school, that's decided by the schools. And we are not involved in that decision. We get a loan once it's made, once, it's, once that person has made that, the family, students have made that decision, they've left school, and we get that, as soon as they've made the loan, we get that on our system. Um, I, I, everybody thinks I'm going to disagree with Deanne all the time, but I do think consist, <laughs> having more standards for important processes um, is, in, is one of those things I think we need to have. We need to have discussions. You know, and they felt there was a common manual on how you approach things. I think we can start with that and move forward. How do we do payment allocation? How do we do, what kinds of forbearance are appropriate for some? You know, how long does somebody get a forbearance? We use forbearance 
to get people into income-driven repayment. Um, but I think, let me, and I know you, know, you, don't, you don't want to talk about complexity, but, but I do think for borrowers who are looking at this system, we have layered onto this student loan system with good intentions. I mean, every reform has been with good intentions, a new program to uh, base a different level of income on a different level of payment, or a different type of forgiveness, or a different type of deferment. Um, and now, in repayment, a borrower has 56 options, 56. And they have 16 repayment plans, nine of which are based on income, with all kind of different names that all kind of sound the same. And, and, and getting into income-driven repayment is complex in itself. And let me just talk about it, just say uh, one thing, is that I think it should be easier to get into income-driven repayment. It just is too hard today. Um, your graduate students, no problem. They have no problem. But we're reaching out to borrowers in delinquency, and we pre-qualify them. We have a, we, you know, we get them on the phone. We say, "Gosh, you are eligible for this program. It's great. It's you're going to pay zero. You're not going to have to have any monthly payment. Now, go out, get your FSA pin, sign into your FSA account." And I, you know, I was at a, I was at the service center. Come up with center. five questions. Oh my like. gosh! Oh my goodness! And, and this is a borrower with no income. 25% yeah. of our borrowers uh, in income-driven repayment when they enter certify that they have no income. So they don't use the IRS poll anyway. Another 25% give us alternative payroll information. So we have 50% that aren't, aren't using the IRS poll, but they still have to go to the Department of Education, to, to studentloans.gov, fill out a 12-page form. I watched a borrower trying to walk through that form and it took them, th our, we have specially trained people because IDR is complex. We have people on the phone walking through who, are, who know the complexities and nuances of these plans. It took 30 minutes. No, you say no on question nine, you get to skip to question 16. No, 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 you don't need to answer question 10. So those are the kinds of interactions that we're having, and you're right, it's expensive. You, they need 30 minutes. That's, you may need time to walk through it. And you need to have the financial incentives and you know, have some type of activity-based fees as well as the financial incentives placed in the right place. This is the system we have today. You can reform going forward, but today we have a lot of borrowers that we have to work with. And, and those are the kinds of things I think we can really do to improve. improve, slim it down, improve the efficiencies, improve the incentives, create better standards. All of those, I think, are important reforms that we need to talk about. There, I mean, one way. To make the transition could be, you know, for example, if we do set up a, um, um, a payroll deduction system that somebody who goes in distress is automatically enrolled, you know, and that's just, it doesn't yeah. require a proactive Well, I, you know, you have a problem. I don't know, Deanne, how you feel because you're yeah. the lawyer on the panel, but, 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 I get to go next. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, there is legislation out there to automatically enroll people after 120 days of delinquency, but it starts for new borrowers. Because the promissory note, there is no authority for us to put them into that. Now, you could change that, but I have a lot, you know, in terms of legal rights, these, this, is, this, this is not what they signed when they signed. So, so yeah, I think it's difficult to do that, um, automatically put people in, unless they've given you permission when they sign, take the money. And I, I just, just to say, um, the four things that I started with are all problems for automatic payroll deduction. So. First of all, prioritizing the student loan debt to such a degree, then again, there's people have a lot of other debts and other issues and other problems. So you're automatically saying that this is, you know, this is going to be this top priority debt. The legal enforceability issue. But it's not. It's automatically zero if your earnings are low enough. Right, I'm, but if the floor, I don't have the confidence that, the, that this floor is really going to be, you know, based on other experience, it's really going to capture all the people that are struggling. If it really works that way and we have like a, you know, fifty thousand dollar, a very high income floor. Um, you know, where where the payment is zero, maybe then it would work okay. But that to me is is a big if. Um, the legal enforceability issue is huge, and I guess that gets a little bit to what Sarah's talking about. Um, it's it's assuming that people owe these debts, and I realize I see a, a disproportionate number of people who have, uh, you know, defenses to enforceability, but it's a lot of people. And so um, going into it assuming that the debt is actually owed is a problem that, again, maybe are problems we can deal with, but they're all problems with 
going right to the automatic system. Um, and then also, uh, you know, the, the so, so I think I we, we can look at maybe designing a system like that. I have some, those kinds of concerns. I think that the system we have now, at least for now, can be better. And it sometimes is better. I mean, I, I find um, there's inconsistency among the servicers, but, there's, but inconsistent means that sometimes they do a good job. So we have to <laughs> capture um, those times that they do a good job and find out why. Um, and I didn't, the last thing I want to say for now is I didn't mean to say that complexity is not a problem. I'm all for simplifying. Just saying it's not, sometimes it's everyone hides behind the complexity. I actually don't know where the, we can go later over the 56, because I think that's an exaggeration, but you guys can show me where that comes from. But yes, it's too complex. But there are some things that are so simple, like that drive me crazy. So for example, when you, when you consolidate, when you're in default, you have a choice of either going right into IDR or making three payments first. And how, that's simple. It's one or the other. And I've heard so many times now, I have a whole list of examples of borrowers who are told that they have to make the three payments. So yes, a lot of things are com complex, but that's a simple one. It's an either and or. You look at the law, the regulation, it's either or, and they get it wrong all the time. And I think it's because the incentives, um, they're paid more when the borrowers make the three payments first. So there's definitely room for reform but there's also ways to take what we have now and make it work a lot better for borrowers. I mean, once it gets to the servicer, they have to make three payments once they get to the servicer because they wouldn't be paid more for that. This is a post. This is a post yeah, default. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I want to talk to Paul. I know you're going to ask. We have about to make sure though that we don't let the fact that a solution is not going to solve all the problems deter us from implementing solutions that will solve a lot of problems. I mean, people who don't know the debt know the repayment scheme is going to solve that problem and not right. have. I think it's interesting. There are a multitude of options for repayment right now, and it, perhaps you know there are fewer people who are falling into falling into delinquency. However, there are about 8.1 million people who are in default right now, and some of these people have defaulted for the second time. A lot of these people are from the FELT program, which is the bank-based program that no longer exists. How do you address that population? What do you do to ensure that they don't remain in that status? Uh, I'm, thank you. I'm, I know Dean wanted to ask you. I was going to start. Good idea. Yes. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Because I think that's, I think, and, 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 and it's one of the frustrating things I have with the discussion of delinquency because we lump delinquency default. Delinquency, if we can get that borrower and get them back into repayment and get them into income driven repayment, there's so many options there. The, the, the real key is keeping them going from going over that 360 day um, when they get transferred to collections. Um, and then they get, what happens is 360 days without payment, and then they go over to uh, the Department of Education collection system, and they have 90 days to resolve it, and then they get sent out to a collection agency. So that's, and, but, but very, very few, what, that's where we see increasing. Even though the numbers of borrowers entering is going down, the total number is going up. And why is that is so few are able to figure out how to leave delinquency. And, and part of that is, again, a, a not being able to navigate that system. And that is, um, that's what's increasing. It's like, I, I have a colleague, it's called like a rock pile. It's, it's not, delinquencies move in and out and they are going, and they are trending down. And that's all good. But over here, we've got these people who have been in default and it's increasing. And what's interesting to me is that the, the federal government never writes it off, never writes it off. And the Department of Treasury recently did a pilot. They, they took a 5,000 or so borrowers who um, had been in, are in, were in default, and they ran their own sort of, let's do soft collections, let's see how it works. They wanted to learn about it, and they published a report. And they put up, they, they had a sample, their sample they said was similar to the, SAM, the overall portfolio of defaulted borrowers. And 1,700 out of the 5,000 some borrowers had been in default on average 17 years. 17 years. So that's what we see in these numbers. And, and what I think would, is really important, and if anybody is here who can help with this, 
is, is to find out more about, have more data on those borrowers. Who is in default? Who are these people? How long have they been in default? What are their balances? How have their balances grown? Because I don't think, trying to figure out solutions for that, we don't have good data there. We have good data about, on borrowers and servicing, great, much better information coming out on that. Do not have really great information on borrowers who are in default. And, and there are ways out of default that Deanne can talk about, and there are important ways out of default, but it, it, is, it, is, it is really being able to reach those borrowers. That system, there's more money in that system than others, but, but it's still, um, those are borrowers that don't, that are really, really struggling. And they also, so a lot of them are my clients, so I can say it's, it's not only are they in default for such long periods of time, but I know that a lot of my, bar, my clients redefault. Um, I know because the ones that recontact me, they're back in default, and I'm sure there's a lot more who don't. So that's frustrating for me, of course. It's much worse for them. Yes. And if they're, I think we need to be really open-minded about ways to help those borrowers. And a couple of quick solutions. Get rid of the private collection agency role. Um, I don't know why, especially now that actually about, they say about three quarters of the um, resolutions, quote unquote resolutions, that um, help the borrowers get out of default are actually a rehabilitation plan. So it's really helping people get to a particular option. So um, why we need private collectors to do that who are incentivized with particular sort of monetary incentives I think is something that we need to look at again. Um, but also, we have trouble when the government's doing the collecting too, so I'm not saying that that's going to solve the whole problem. Um, but also, that the solutions, the ways to get out of default really aren't that complicated. Um, I think we need to look at them all and make sure they work, But under because I don't think they do um, all the time. But, but the ones that exist, are not that difficult, and so there should be ways to line up the incentives or get the right people to, you know, to help people get out of default, assuming, again, that they actually, you know, that they actually owe the debt. Um, so, and the last thing I would say is that we have a very unforgiving system. So part of the reason that there's redefault and part of the reason people stay in default so long is that each of those options, borrowers get one chance. Um, and, to, to use, and I have no idea why that's the case. Why, you know, have some limits maybe, or have some, you know, sort of requirements for people, but why give them only one chance to get out of default? Um, we know in lots of other parts of life, businesses, certainly people have a lot more chances when they don't succeed the first time around. Um, so, you know, there's a really, re the hammer really comes down on people in that context. And I think that's set up for the businesses and for the contractors. It's not set up for the borrowers. Um, that can also lead to, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know we all. Um, I think Sarah's point about more information is really important. There are people, I mean, the, the clients that the entities are of a, have certain kinds of situations. There are people in default for different reasons and different circumstances. And we need to understand more about that so that we can design more nuanced approaches. Um, but also, I think maybe we can learn something. I mean, think about the loan modification that came about with the mortgage crisis. And we're, we don't think creatively really enough about what other approaches we might use to try to alleviate some of the problems of borrower questions and borrower I want to, you know, there's, um, your point about the promissory notes is, a, is, is an important one. And you know that, that uh, automatic deduction wasn't built into that. Um, but I have found uh, um, that things that lawyers said were impossible then happen um, because somebody gets creative. So 10 years ago, IRS said that the data retrieval tool was impossible. There was no way you could ever have um, data from the IRS being ported into the FAFSA. Not going to happen. And what do you know? We now have it because somebody got creative about it. And similarly, I think there could be some creativity around, you know, providing incentives to borrowers to um, uh, sign, you know, existing borrowers to sign up for automatic deduction with some sort of forgiveness built in or a lower interest rate and give people strong incentives um, uh, uh, to get in. Um, so there's no, I, I don't want you know, when I'm, when, I'm rec when I'm saying that I think that uh, um, payroll deduction um, and universal uh, IBR is, is the way to go, I'm not saying that every person is going to respond and every person is going to get into it in the same way. 
we have to deal with people's individual problems. Uh, uh, but I don't see um, uh, a way to run this program in a way that really is sensitive to people's earnings in the way that it should be without it being a universal program. Um, I, this is small. I mean, a lot of these things are, sm I have a small recommendation, but it's, it's important. I think, you know, there are, you know, I, I think the term collection agency is, you know, is unfortunate because I think, for example, we have a company that, we have a couple companies that do work with the student loan defaulted borrowers, and it is counseling. It's one-on-one -on -one counseling. And, and their incentives, I think I, they're going to be issuing a new contract for that, and they can someday. build in the incentive. Yeah, someday. Um, but they're going to build in, the, they can build in the incentives to, to, you know, for rehabilitation, for consolidation. But one of the, this is a small thing, and, and one of the things that we see in both, because we, we see collections and we do see servicing, is that transition from collections back to servicing can sometimes be bumpy. And one of our recommendations has been, um, in, in, particularly for those bars who are in rehabilitation, you've defaulted on your loan, now you're getting in, now to resolve that default, you can make nine out of 10 monthly payments on time, and your default is, a you, you are put back in good standing. Your default is removed from your credit score, your credit bureau, not the delinquencies, but the default is, and you're put back into servicing. Now, you, you can base that payment on your income as low as $5 a month. So you can make those $5 a month then transitioning back to servicing, there's a gap because you can't use the information that doesn't move. Mm -hmm. The income information doesn't move to the servicer and they have to start early. We at, at our company, we look for those borrowers. We, we reach out as soon as they come in and say, by the way, you need to apply for income driven <laughs> repayment. And, and as a result, we have lower delinquencies in the, for those borrowers, but still making it automatic having a standard form that the collectors use and then move over to the servicers to make that transition seamless. So the borrower goes straight from paying $5 a month to maybe paying $0 a month. I mean, that is, is, is like very small, but could help so much. And I, so we really hope to see something like that happen soon. I want to toss in one thing that hasn't, that hasn't been mentioned yet about why so many people might be struggling with their loans. Um, which is something I learned as I was talking to people around the world about how they structure their student loan systems. Did a conference here in DC in June and had people here from Germany, Australia, Sweden, England talking about how they run their student loan system. And the thing that jumped out at me was that um, the US is a huge outlier on how long people are given to repay their loans. I have come across no other country in which 10 years is the standard repayment system, uh, the standard repayment horizon. And obviously taking a dollar amount and dividing it by 10 years leads to a bigger payment than taking a dollar amount and dividing it by 20 or 25, so which, which are the standard numbers everywhere else I have looked. Um, in Australia, you pay a very low amount uh, per percentage of your earnings and you pay until you're done. Um, and if it takes you 20 years, fine. And if it takes you 25, fine. It takes many people five years. You know, one, one sort of unheralded um, um, benefit of an income-based repayment plan is that people who are earning lots of money can actually pay off quicker than they would otherwise. So in um, Australia, for example, the typical BA is paying off within about five, seven years. Uh, so um, uh, 10 years uh, as the automatic default seems to be problematic, I think. It automatically means that a lot of people uh, have payments uh, larger than they can handle. This interacts, of course, with the interest rate. So I think if you're gonna have a longer repayment horizon, you need to have a lower interest rate. And most countries have lower interest rates than we do. So one of the things I wanted to kind of get into, I think in the last couple of months, we've seen uh, the White House shifting the conversation about student debt crisis is more so towards a completion crisis mm -hmm than necessarily a debt crisis. Is this the correct direction that we should be focused on if we're talking about who's struggling and what to do to help them? It's certainly an important uh, focus because we know, for example, that the default rates among people who don't complete their degrees are three times higher than the default rates among people who do. So uh, helping some of 
these students to complete is likely going to mean that they are, are, are not going to be safe. It doesn't mean that this is an either or situation, of course, because no matter what we do for completion, we're going to have a lot of students who start and don't complete. And as long as we want to have access to higher education, there are going to be students who don't complete. And we have to make sure that the system treats those students in a reasonable way. So I, I mean, I'm skeptical that we have succeeded in getting away from the, the discussion of a crisis. I think we hear it all the time. And I certainly, like when I say, I don't think that's the best description people attack me left and right for because they know somebody who's in crisis. And of course, there are people in crisis and we make, need to make sure that we don't allow one conversation to totally replace the other one. I mean, the default rate's been dropping mm -hmm. dramatically. Mm -hmm the economy has been booming. I mean, so I'm afraid that what's going to happen is the next time a recession comes around, we're going to be in a crisis again. So, you know, just sort of counting on the economy to fix our problems with repayment. We need a, we need a, we need a shockproof system that the next time the economy tanks, we're not going to um, uh, drag down borrowers um, with it. So I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, I think what we saw in 2009, 2010 is we saw a surge of enrollments in community colleges and for-profit schools and in open enrollment schools. And these are more non-traditional students who, who couldn't find a job returning and went to school instead. And then they borrowed. And if you're an independent student, you're, the amounts you can borrow are more. You know, you're, instead of borrowing $7,000 a year, you're borrowing $10,000, $12,000 a year. So you can get close to $50,000 a year, uh, $50,000 for four years of school. And that's, and that's I think that's, that's, I, I absolutely agree. And when it, we're not talking about inform, you know, the front end of the process in today's forum, but I think that is, in order to avoid the next crisis, college completion is important. And if someone is going to borrow for school, we, they need to, be, to know what it takes to get that degree and have better information. We do an annual survey, we'll be coming out later this month, um, of 22 to 35 year olds called Money Under 35 and it's on their financial health. And what we see is those borrower, those students or young adults who have gone to college, not completed, and they borrowed to go to college and not, did not complete, fall behind their peers on almost every aspect of their financial life. In fact, they are behind the people that never went to school. So they're high school peers. They are behind, and they get further behind as they get into their 30s. So what's so critical is before, before we have another economic downturn and people turn to go to community college or go to open enrollment schools to, because they can't find a job, is we need to have, make sure that they have not just the one-year information. How much does it cost to go to one-year school? How much does it cost me to get that degree? What do I have to do to get that degree? And because it really doesn't make sense to borrow unless you're going to get that degree. I would just add, I, I agree with all of this, but I want to, um, just like everything, there's a nuance to completion also, which is, <clears throat> you know, the, the Obama administration is focusing on completion. They're also doing a lot, as most of us know, to crack down on the for-profit sector. And even um, those who complete, particularly in that sector, um, are not necessarily succeeding either. So it's not, um, and I'm not saying, it's not only about completion, um, particularly in that sector. And, and a lot of the clients we see now that we're seeing, particularly with all these schools closing, a lot of them actually did complete. I'd, I would say we're actually seeing more clients now who completed, um, particularly this is at Corinthian schools in particular, but we're seeing a lot of ITT also. And they're in, unfortunately, just um, as bad situation as those who didn't complete. So once again, there's that you know, really important nuance that for sure the Obama administration is definitely looking at also and doing some aggressive work now. Let me also say with regard to that, that obviously completion it is, I mean, I think it's hard to argue against efforts to help students complete and meet their goals. That said, when you look at all the stories of people out there who are struggling, if you take each one individually, a very high percentage of them, you can say, whoa, this could have been prevented. Right. And we've got to figure out better ways to get students, I mean, part of it is if you, if you know that you're doing something that, you know, you, you, I mean, you don't really know what you're doing or what you're doing, you just can't get a job, why are you going to a more expensive for-profit instead of going to a community college? If you're going to a community college, you know why. You know what the payoff to different degrees is. But many of the stories are about, you know, I got a master's degree in history from some place you never heard of, and I borrowed $150,000, and now I can't pay it back. And, and these stories generate a, a lot of sympathy for people. I, as a taxpayer, don't want to pay back that $150,000 for that master's degree in history. We need to figure out much better ways 
reason that people who get into these circumstances, whether they complete or not. So let's talk about one solution that I've heard at least discussed on the campaign trail, refinancing student loans. And who that would benefit and how much of, a, of, of an assistance would that be to people who are struggling with debt. Talk to me about that. So if you take the, the typical student debt of, you know, obviously, so say you take a, a debt of say $20,000. Know, so the typical BA comes out with about 30,000 in debt. Um, the typical debt is more like 5,000. So let's, let's talk about say 20 is something in the middle. Right? The, um, uh, the payment on that at a 3% interest rate is about 220. You cut the interest rate in half or you increase the interest rate by half you're gonna change the payment by about 25 or $30 a month. So it's not, it doesn't make a huge difference um, for the monthly payments. And if somebody is struggling to pay 220, making it 200 isn't gonna make a huge difference in their ability to repay. Who's gonna benefit? The people with the biggest loans, right? And who are the people with the biggest loans? The people who are the graduate students, mm -hmm. right? So it is an extremely expensive and ineffective not a good combination, right? So, um, and regressive. Okay, we'll add that in as okay. well. So it's getting really bad, right? So the, the most of the money will go to people who are doing quite well, um, uh, who have large debts and aren't having a problem. So I see it as ill-targeted. Uh, it's also, I mean, the thing is we do have an interest rate problem, right? If you have taken an, a, a student loan every year, you have different loans at different interest rates. And obviously what always happens is when interest rates are low in the economy, people are like, we need to, be able to let people pay at the market rate. And then interest rates go up and people say, oh my gosh, you know, we don't want people to pay at that rate. And we need to think about who is paying. So somebody, I mean, the government does cost the government money. We, we won't get into that whole complexity. But the reality is that we need to figure out when the taxpayer should bear more of the risk and when the students should uh, have the responsibility. The taxpayers in many cases should be bearing a lot of the risk and that's what income driven repayment is about. If we had variable interest rates, then nobody would be paying uh, when interest rates are 3% in the economy, nobody would be out there paying you know, 7% on their federal student loans. So there are ways to solve this, but I think we have to address the question by saying who should be paying, not just we don't want those borrowers to pay and we have to figure out when they should pay. I think one of the other things, kind of keeping along that line of uh, solutions for borrowers, especially borrowers who gra graduate and those who tend to go to four-year schools or get graduate degrees, uh, the discussion about the economic impact of student debt. That's been very controversial lately because you have the Fed, Federal Reserve Bank saying one thing that, you know, it is delaying home ownership, delaying household formation, and then you have some other folks somebody who might be on this panel, mm -hmm. saying that ah, perhaps it's a little overblown. Talk to me about how much of a role that part of the conversation should play in our overall understanding of repayment and student debt. Actually, the, the feds are disagreeing amongst themselves. <laughs> yeah, well, on New this York topic. says one, St. Louis um, says another. So, you know, the, the New York Fed uh, showed with its credit report data that people who had student loans um, were less likely uh, to purchase homes than people who, um, uh, who didn't, or specifically to hold mortgages, because that's what you can see in the credit reports. The thing is that the New York Fed data didn't have any information about education levels. So they couldn't distinguish between people who had no student debt and had never been to college and people who had student debt. You know, there, there was sort of big missing variable. You kind of want to know uh, uh, who went to college and who didn't. The Board of, Reser um, uh, Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, which is a, a, another branch of the Fed, uh, did have that information and were able to show uh, uh, that um, uh, a lot of the, the findings of the New York Fed just, just didn't hold water. Um, uh, it is indeed true that if you look at, say, a 24-year-old who's gone to college and a 24-year-old who hasn't gone to college, the one who hasn't gone to college may be ahead on their earnings, and they may be more likely to hold a home, to have a home and a car. And it's not because college and borrowing are bad ideas, it's that they've got like six more years of work experience. So this is well known among labor economists. There's a point in your late 20s or so, or your early 20s, when those people who you know, went straight out of high school and started working, they got more stuff than you do. You're still a poor college student, bummer. Another 10 years, you're gonna be living the life. 
and they're still in the same place, unfortunately, because that's what our economy looks like. So basically, you know, people who have a high school degree or less, their earnings just tend to be like this for their lives. And the people who have more education, their earnings go like this. Right? So you don't want to look at people in their early 20s if you want to look at what the impact of, of going to college is. And that, again, was another problem with the, with the, with the Fed analysis. So we, don't, we have basically, I'd say, um, zero compelling evidence uh, that um, debt is destroying the lives of college students or it has made it such that people should not go to college. People who go to college and graduate from college in our economy are the winners. Uh, and uh, you know, I fear that you know, a, a narrative that that, that, that talks about how, how um, uh, impoverished they are, again, is, is regressive. It's going to lead to policies that put more money in the hands of people who are the winners or in our economy. Another problem with some of this research is what's the comparison that you're making? And too often you see, let's compare somebody with a bachelor's degree and student debt to somebody with that same degree and no student debt. And we would all rather not have the student debt if we have the education and the job that we got by going to college. So if you look at, I mean, my kids, you know, went to college and graduated and don't have student debt. And you know what? Their assets are higher than the assets of somebody who, who, didn't, who borrowed for college. And part of that is that they don't have debt. But much more of it is because I helped them with a down payment for their house. The same things that made them graduate without debt made them have a lot of different circumstances in their lives. So it's very difficult research to do. And we have to really watch those headlines that say, we see that student debt stops you from doing all of these things. Um, well, I, so just plugging our survey, which our research is coming out in two weeks, um, Money Under 35. Um, we, we, we did this last year. and We looked at this. Uh, we, we, it was important to us to look at all millennials, 22 to 35, and, and discern by educational attainment. And what we saw in the mortgage areas, in the ability of a mortgage, is that you know, you got your bachelor's degree or you got a degree, you are far more likely, whether or not you borrowed, you are far more likely to have a mortgage than the people who did not get a degree. And, 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 and that was that segment, the people that went to college and did not get, the, get their degree, they were behind in their 20s, they were about even with their high school peers in their 20s. And in their 30s, those who had debt were falling behind, no degree debt were falling behind uh, uh, their, the high school people were getting homes. They were, they were increasing their percentage, were incre getting homes, but the people that had debt and no degree were the ones that were, were falling behind. Do we have time for any questions from the audience? Or five minutes? Okay, excellent. Do we have any questions from the audience? Anything that you guys would like to, for us to discuss? You're scared of us, yeah. right? <laughs> Don't be intimidated. I'm scared of us. <laughs> uh, we have I like that we have an alternate. Hi, we have a question from Twitter, so we'll start there and maybe others in the room will want to chime in after that. Um, how do we balance calls for solutions tailored for different groups or situations with complaints that there are too many options? Well, well. <laughs> you go, go. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I think um, I, I, I'm a one note Singer here, you know. So I do think that a system that automatically adjusts is one that adjusts to lots of different circumstances. You know, if you've got a rigid um, program in place that you need, if if you if you have a rigid set of rules that can't flex over time, then each person has to pick an individual rigid set of rules. Right? Okay, I'm going to take this rigid program, but this rigid program over here is better for you, and you over there, that rigid program is the one you need which gets confusing very quickly. You know, we've got a fairly complicated tax system, as many would point out, but you know, it's pretty simple for us to pay uh, into Social Security and um, for our FICA um, uh, taxes. It's a very, uh, as far as we're concerned with our work, there's a lot of complexity behind the scenes, but it doesn't affect the user, you know, the, the, the person who's actually saving for Social Security. And that, I think, should be a model um, uh, for how we run the loan system. So I think, I think that's a great question. And, and one of the, my concerns, obviously, is as we, as we look at options to f fix the program, is that we have a complex system today. And we, what we've done, what, you know, this is a system built on good intentions, layers, layers, layers. And, 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 and at some point, you know, again, nine income-based repayment plans. I mean, at some point, there should be one or two 
<laughs> but there shouldn't be. But, but, but what I see is, you know, we say, yeah, but, okay, let's just simplify it. Let's bring it down. But, but, but we need to have this, and we need to have this plan. And so it, it, it really has to be very thoughtfully done in a way that it, we really do have simplicity as a goal, and, and, and we stay with it. Because that means you're going to have to cut out some very popular deferments, forgiveness, repayment plans. So that's, you know, I think we, that is a discussion that is going to take a lot longer than five minutes. But I think as, as, as people approach reforming the system, my, my goal is let's make it simpler without making it more complex. I, I, I would just add, I mean, yes, it's a good question. It's, it's a hard answer. But um, w watching the politics of all this enough to know that it's usually the least politically powerful who lose out when the when when you you know dole out different options to different people, and so that that piece about like legal enforceability just to start with, and knowing that a lot of people don't owe the debt in the first place or that it's not the highest priority, I agree it's possible to design a system that takes those interests into account. I just have seen too many times that they're the ones who, who usually lose out when a solution comes out. So I feel like um, as we look at this, it's not a simple answer of how to balance simplicity with making sure that, there, that we sort of um, you know, address all the different interests. But I'd like us to see a hierarchy, hierarchy of whose interests we most want to address and make sure that those who really are struggling the worst or who were ripped off or whatever really are the ones that we put the highest priority in. Um, and that's something that's always been a challenge all along. I want to, uh, can I say something that, that, that complements that, I think? You know, if, if we are going to have a, um, I mean, as it is right now, we have sort of the full force of the government behind collections on, on student loans, and you can't get away from them. And because of that, we should be far more attentive to regulating the institutions that, that students are borrowing to go to. Right, so, um, uh, and I think that Department of Education is picking up on this quite a bit, um, but we've got a legacy of millions of people who took out loans during a period where that wasn't taken seriously. Do we have room for what, time for one more question? Um, uh, sorry, I wanted to ask uh, Deanne and Sarah if there was, um, if we're preserving sort of the, the system that we have now with servicers being as they are, what would you think with the, with some advances in counseling and with contact, we might be getting we might be able to achieve in terms of default or delinquency rates? If there was a, a sort of a, a goal that you might set for, for those sort of levels? You mean a, a numerical goal? Or a, so, and, and if possible, I mean, if there, would be, if there would be sort of a goal that we could, with the system, without a, a full reform of the system or a revolution, I guess you could say, uh, in the systems that we, we use at the moment, if there would be a particular goal we could aspire to. And just um, so I get, one thing is, I didn't say we'd preserve it exactly the way it was, so let be clear about that. Um, there's some really important changes. It's just, uh, it was sort of, we were putting it in contrast to the automatic system, I think, so be clear about that. There's a, there's a lot of ways. Um, it could be even some of the things like Sue talked about, like a, a single entity or fewer entities or you know standards and all that. But, but within that, I think if you complement it with giving um, more of a, a you know, a cushion, I don't want to call it a cushion, but giving more chances for borrowers who don't succeed or who do go into default the first time around, um, you know, so that there's, there's more people who, uh, there's always going to be people, no matter how good of a system you create, who are still going to default, I guess is the point. Now, I don't know exactly what number that would be compared to what it is now. I think that if you do some of the improvements I talk about to servicing, I feel like, you know, you should be able to cut that number who go into default very significantly. I don't know if it's half, but that's certainly something to aspire to. But there's still going to be people who are going to default. And so if you combine that with this system that allows people not just one chance to go back in again, then I think you could make an even bigger you know, cut into the, the people who are at least in long-term default. Um, and again, I don't, I'm not the, maybe the, the numbers person here, but I feel like you know, you're still going to have some people who default. But I feel like if you, if you have all of the reforms going along with some simplification of the programs themselves, you, know, you could cut the, the number of people in default as much as like half to three quarters of what we have now. You could use the, you mean the lower limit? You could think of as like what the default rate is at the very selective institutions sure, where almost everybody graduates, 5%. 
you know, yeah. even in good years, um, not non-recessionary years, 5% was kind of the default rate. And that's around, you know, something less, a little bit less than that is what it is for grad students. So there's always going to be something, and 5% might be a... So <laughs> I like that you asked the question, because I get to agree with Deanne at the end. So there you go. Um, Fantastic. Um, the default rate for the last quarter that's been published, so June was one, the bars entering default was 1.7%. So that's a quarterly rate, and that makes annualized rate. I can't do the math in my head for. <laughs> I knew they could over this. Six, eight, six, six, I, gosh, I'm embarrassing myself as a math major. But anyway, so that's, you annualize that by multiplying by four. It can go lower. I mean, Navient's servicing, our default rate's 30% lower than the, the major servicers. So, so we think we can drive that down further with the right incentives, getting it to the right, making sure that you are, again, the incentives, tweaking the incentives in terms of school type, you know, graduate versus non-graduate, perfect, good. School type is also making sure you're targeting it to those borrowers who went to the high default rate schools. And yes, I think we can get it lower. I don't, I don't have a number, but I think, I think, it, I definitely think it could get 30% lower if everybody came, did what we did. So um, I think it can get lower. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you so much for this great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. So thank you so much, Danielle, Susan, Sandy, uh, Deanne, and Sarah for a great start to the event. We're going to give everyone a five-minute break to stretch and engage with us on social media at hashtag PewFamFinance, and we'll, um, I'd like to invite the next panel to come up and get mic'd.
Charlotte, and NASA, so we're a student chair. So we work with you guys on some different issues and So as Travis mentioned, the second panel today is really going to be digging below the national headlines and focusing on who is struggling with debt and some of the reasons why. Um, I'm joined in this discussion by four experts. They're each going to tackle one or two specific populations, but then I hope during our discussion we'll get more broad. Um, we of course welcome questions from the audience via mobility events at pewtrust.org and also on Twitter via the hashtag PewFamFinance. So let me just give a quick introduction to our panelists, um, and then they'll each give three or four minutes of remarks, and we'll start our discussion. Um, so Jeff Webster, sitting directly to my left, is the director of research at TG, and has overseen numerous studies on student loan default, debt burden, and student retention. His latest research focuses on the efficacy of student loan counseling. Fenaba Addo, directly to his left, is an assistant professor of consumer science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where her research examines how constraints on economic and financial resources manifest within the family, health outcomes, and over the life course. Her work predominantly focuses on black and Latino populations, older women, and younger adults. Walter Achenko is the policy director at Veterans Education Success. Prior to VES, he worked for the U.S. Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, where he focused on veterans' education issues. And finally, last but definitely not least, Stephanie, Stephanie Cellini is an associate professor of public policy and economics at George Washington University. She is also a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and an associate editor of Education Finance and Policy. Her research interests include education policy, labor economics, and public finance. So I'm going to turn things over to you. OK, thanks. Uh, so uh, I work for TG, uh, director of research there. Uh, TG is a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to helping students make wise decisions. And that has informed a lot of our research. And I've been doing research on student debt and repayment patterns for about 30 years. And I think the important thing to remember uh, about student repayment is that higher education is an excellent investment with good odds of delivering handsome returns to students who are academically successful. And uh, successful repayment uh, can be expected for students who have four things. One is a... Um, <clears throat> justifiable confidence in their academic ability. Uh, two, that they have the financial resources to be able to attend full time uh, without the distractions of working full time or having significant family obligations. Three, uh, that they have academic and career pathways that will leave them with comfortable debt to income ratios. And then the fourth and final, is that they have a firm understanding of the terms and conditions of their student loan. So in other words, a lot of people are going to be in a lot of trouble because uh, they don't really meet all those four conditions. And <clears throat> this is going to be especially true for students who are from low and moderate income families and those who are first generation and less knowledgeable about this pretty darn complex financial system we have for higher education. So my research has recently been focused on the efficacy of federal student loan counseling. Uh, we've taken a deep dive into what do they know and why don't they know what they need to know. The other uh, thing that we've been looking at is the prevalence of high unmet need uh, and how that has influenced the ways in which students go about uh, college, uh, leading to a more costly pathway and one that is much less reliable for uh, returning good results. And then finally, we've done a lot of looking at the role of debt to income ratios by major, by institution. And we even developed a online tool called Major Choices that is designed to allow borrowers to get a better sense of that as they're making decisions about what to study or even where to attend. 
So that's kind of been the focus of our research. Um, looking forward to the discussion. Hi. So as the number of uh, students of color increase in the pursuit of post-secondary education um, in hopes of obviously upward social mobility and uh, economic stability, I have entered this conversation um, questioning whether the accumulation of student loan debt is actually um, either increasing the racial wealth gap or um, uh, cre uh, also, uh, if it's um, cre contributing to the ongoing persistence of the ra intergenerational racial wealth gap. So I raise this issue in particular because as studies have shown, black students tend to rely on student loans more so than whites. They have higher debt burdens. They tend to be more concerned about repayment and the affordability of their payments and are more likely to default. So some of the research that I have done with, along with some of my colleagues have found that parental wealth does not seem to be as protective of student loan debt accumulation for black students as it is for their white counterparts. Um, while there does not seem to be any significant differences in the ability of, in the ability of parents to give payments to their, to their children while they're going through the, co through the college process, there does seem to be some significant differences in the amounts that they are actually able to give. So in our research, we found that on average, white parents contributed about $12,000 over the course of the college career compared with about $4,200 that black parents were able to give and support their students. We posit that black parents at the high ends of the uh, black wealth distribution are less able to transfer wealth to their children due to the, uh, due to the fact that they have um, less liquid, uh, their, their wealth is in less liquid assets such as, um, that would be such as stocks, bonds, or savings. And wealthy parents have to set, uh, wealthy black parents, or should I say high, um, high uh, wealth, well, parents that are at the high end of the wealth distribution, of the black wealth distribution, tend to have su substantially less home equity and only half the financial assets of whites at similar points in their distribution. We also looked at, in, as it pertains to repayment, that young adult net worth serves as a factor in this racial wealth gap. And <clears throat> that a $10,000 increase in young adult net worth, so this is um, between the ages of 25 and 30, is associated with 7.6% less student loan debt. So with regards to student loan debt, those with high net worth may have benefited from transfers from their parents um, or cross generations or intergenerationally and it may be in a better position to pay down their student loans quicker. So I'll, I'll just conclude there by saying that this all suggests that intergener intergenerational transfers of wealth may not persist uh, for re these recent <coughs> co uh, cohorts of young adults and especially black children who are coming from middle class or um, higher net worth households. And like their parents and their grandparents' generations may find the pathway to middle class stability um, and upward mobility to be a tenuous one. So I look forward to discussing some of these topics um, as we continue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just wanted to say that Veterans Education, Education Success is a small nonprofit um, that focuses on the promise and the integrity of the GI Bill. Um, we work with a lot of veterans. Uh, to help them address uh, issues that they've confronted in, in using their, their benefits. So I wanted to ad address a couple of questions. You know, who are veterans and why might some of them be struggling with student loan debt? And the first point I wanted to make is that veterans are non-traditional students. Um, so they face some of the same uh, challenges that that, uh, that population cohort faces. So they, they tend to be older, they tend to be married, they tend to have children. They tend to be the first in their family to go to college. Um, about a third are minorities, and about a third have uh, disabilities of some sort. Um, so veterans have both strengths and challenges that they face in, in using their benefit. Uh, on the str strength side, they have discipline and motivation. I think that research has shown that. On the challenges side, um, they often lack academic preparedness. Uh, they have to take remedial classes. Um, there's a certain discomfort with college culture. Um, there's some uncertainty about what their degree uh, goals uh, are. And they, importantly, they lack um, objective advice on how to, how to address these challenges. 
So in, in terms of outcomes for veterans, um, there's not a lot of data. Uh, but I did want to point out that the Student Veterans of America, uh, using data from VA and from the National Student Clearinghouse, uh, published a report about two years ago that showed that actually veterans graduated about the same rate as, as other students do. Um, I wanted to make a few uh, comments. I know this has come up uh, earlier about for-profit uh, education in the United States and, and veterans' participation. So overall, about 10% of students are enrolled in for-profit schools. But actually, the proportion of veterans enrolled in for-profit schools is significantly higher. It's about 27%. And I think, as we all know, for-profits um, are very good at investing in marketing and not very good at investing in uh, outcomes and success. Um, you know, there's a, a, a federal prohibition on the amount of revenue that uh, for-profit schools can receive. It's set at 90%, which is a pretty high mark, I think everybody would <coughs> agree. Um, but the, there's a loophole because uh, this does not include uh, DOD and GI Bill uh, benefits. It only includes Title IV. Um, while overall enrollment in uh, for-profit schools has declined pretty precipitously, it hasn't really changed that much for veterans. So they're still attending for-profit schools. Um, the earlier panel referred to the closure of ITT and uh, Corinthian. And then a point I wanted to make about that is that when veterans leave a school that closes like that, they don't really have very many options for transferring their benefits. They, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, their credits. And they're more likely to have to go to another for-profit, which is not, not necessarily a good thing. Um, so veterans that we work with uh, that have attended a for-profit school tell us that they ended up with, with student debt that they didn't want, need, or authorize, uh, that employers don't respect their degrees, and <clears throat> NCS data, however, showed that a higher proportion of veterans using the GI Bill take out loans uh, attending two-year and four-year schools compared to other institutional sectors. I wanted to refer to uh, Stephanie's uh, excellent study uh, that found that so many students at for-profit schools do not graduate um, and that those who attend generally experience both earnings decline relative to pre-attendance earnings and higher debt. Um, in short, institutional sector choice has the strong potential to affect your success and your transition to civilian life as a veteran. Um, I want to make a few comments about loan debt and non-completion. Um, according to NCS data, uh, veterans borrowed less frequently and accumulated less debt than other independent students. And some veterans don't borrow at all. I think about half probably don't borrow. But NCS data also showed that about 27% of veterans who enrolled in 2011-2012 were no longer enrolled in June 2014. Uh, and they had, about a third of them had cumulative debt of about $10,000. Um, in terms of repayment status, there's some data from uh, NCS surveys. Um, and it, it provides some insights on veterans, federal and private student loan repayment status compared to independent uh, non-veterans. Um, a similar proportion were deferring payment uh, or repaying loans. But more independent non-veterans are in default compared to veterans. Um, and that may have something to do with the generosity of the GI Bill and that some uh, don't need to borrow as much. Um, so what's the financial impact of uh, repayment? So the Bachelors and Beyond uh, NCS uh, survey has data for veterans and independent non-veterans who completed their degrees in 2008 and were in repayment for any federal or private loans in 2012. And it shows that about 72% of veterans' monthly income went to loan repayment, car repayment, housing costs, and daycare, compared to about 82% of independent non-veterans. So they're doing a little bit better. Uh, in terms of repayment stress levels, BNB also uh, collected some data that showed about 42% said that it was high or very high stress level uh, in terms of repaying their, their loans. So I just wanted to conclude by saying that you know, one of the uh, difficulties of talking about veterans and student loan debt is the data. And um, starting in about 2009, uh, the Department of Education stopped asking a question on the FAFSA as, are, are you a veteran or are you active duty? Um, and there's a, a pretty simple solution to that. Um, Ed is pretty resistant about adding that question back. There's, there's a skip pattern. Uh, but you know, it'd be very easy for VA and DOD and DOD and Ed to share data to earmark veterans and active duty in the National Student Loan Database. And um, that hasn't happened yet. 
Thanks so much. What a great lead-in. Um, thanks. Yeah, it's been so great hearing everybody's perspective. So um, I've been studying the for-profit sector uh, kind of as a whole and thinking about these various student groups within that sector and the outcomes of students in the for-profit sector specifically. Um, so as you may know, for-profit enrollment has you know, more than tripled in the last you know, 10, 15 years. Um, it now enrolls about 2 million students. There's been a dip in recent years, um, certainly, but it's, it's grown a lot. Uh, and it, it, this sector disproportionately serves, as we've uh, just heard, you know, non-traditional students, minority students, working students, single parents, and veterans, disproportionate, um, uh, disproportionately in those for-profit colleges. And of course, we've seen the allegations of fraud and abuse, the various investigations, um, and the closure and bankruptcy now, uh, or the closures of ITT Tech and Corinthian uh, based on you know, uh, the Department of Ed's kind of crackdown. So with all this news, um, you know, we really do want to think about students in this sector in particular and what's going on and students' ability to repay their loans once they leave the sector. Um, so some kind of some background here too. We know that in for-profit colleges, about 75% of students borrow, and that's a lot higher than, say, a community college, which is about 19% in community colleges for similar types of associates and certificate programs. Um, and they're also borrowing more, um, and that could be because resources are a little bit lower for those students, typically, um, and tuition is much higher. Tuition at a for-profit college is about $15,000 per year um, in contrast to a community college, uh, which may be about $5,000 a year. Um, so, of course, we expect that there might be this kind of higher debt, um, and we might not be that concerned about higher debt for these students if we felt that um, these for-profit students were getting this nice big bump in earnings, like we see for bachelor's degree students from selective colleges, and um, as, as Sue in the last panel was talking about, they have, you know, typically many students, you know, lots of, the majority of students um, do great after college, and they get these, this great bump in earnings. So my question has been, um, over the last several years, are the for-profit students seeing the same bump? Are they seeing any bump in that earnings? Are they seeing that upward trajectory? And are those earnings gains enough to pay off their debt? Um, and, um, and, you know, from, you know, just some background data too, we can also see that, like, default rates are higher. I didn't mention that. Um, you know, about uh, for-profit students make up about 35% of all defaults, um, and they enroll, again, about, you know, 11% of students. So, um, we know from some of these patterns uh, what's happening, but we don't know how to disentangle sometimes student background and demographics from the kind of college and the institutions themselves and kind of the value of that education and the earnings gains and the quality of that education. Um, so I've been trying to ask, what's that earnings bump that for-profit students are getting for a similar student in a for-profit college to a similar student with similar background characteristics that can match um, in, say, a community college with a similar associate's degree in a similar field, for example, or certificate program. So I've been trying to do that. Um, data has been a challenge. Um, there's some surveys. They tend to have very small samples of for-profit students, um, since, again, it's about 11% of students. So it's, it's tough with some of our kind of more traditional surveys that we've used to look at um, student outcomes in other uh, sectors of higher education. Um, so I've been really excited to work with some new data uh, that finally uh, begins to link some data from the Department of Ed through the gainful employment regulation um, with some data from the US Treasury on the earnings of students before and after they attend a for-profit college. And these types of data linkages between different government agencies at a student level, student level records, the extent we can get them, um, and, and, and I should say I'm, I'm very privileged to work with my colleague Nick Turner who is at the Treasury, um, who has access to these data, uh, but we basically can look at the earnings of students before going to a for-profit college and after. And we can look at very similar students in background characteristics um, and, and look at their kind of before-after bump. And what we're finding is, as, as Walter kind of previewed so nicely, thank you so much, uh, that the for-profit students are not seeing that bump that other sectors see. Um, and they're seeing, you know, very close to zero earnings bump. Very close to zero. Um, you know, small positive gains for some different, some degree programs, some fields, some, you know, um, some particular schools, but for the most part, we're seeing zero and sometimes negative. Sometimes your earnings go down in those next five to six years after you've attended. That's a time when typically people are getting their footing and, and things like that, but five to six years, we're not even seeing that bump that we see even for community colleges. So for-profit students that look similar in background to the for-profit students um, are coming up short. 
And this is largely due to the non-completers, which we've talked about before and I think we'll hopefully come back to on this panel as well. Um, but the students who don't complete degrees at a for-profit college, they see pretty sizable earnings drops, actually. Um, so how can we expect students to repay almost any debt <laughs> if their earnings are actually going down? Um, and they're not getting, getting jobs, basically. Their, their degrees are, are not really worth a whole lot. Um, so these are kind of some kind of newer data, uh, newer patterns that we're exploring. We, we don't have data to look at veterans, for example, in that, in, in that data set. Um, I think we kind of need more of this kind of data-driven evidence that's not, you know, it goes beyond the anecdotes, which I, I am certainly concerned about, you know, the individual students who have had, a, you know, we talked a lot about, um, you know, various given cases and various schools that we might be concerned about in the sector. Um, but we also found in this study that it's not just, we actually did an, an analysis school by school, although we can't name the schools, and it wasn't just that there were a few bad apples, interestingly. It was that a lot of those schools, almost every school was kind of clustered around this like zero return. <laughs> um, zero earnings bump, essentially. Um, so it, it wasn't just a matter of like getting the ITTs and Corinthians necessarily, although that might be a good first start, but it's thinking about the sector as a whole. And really, what are the incentives for these schools? And what are, what's going on with this kind of, um, how valuable are these credentials uh, in the workforce? And I think that's a question that you know, we still need to get more data on. So I will leave it at that for now and turn it back over. Great, thanks so much. So um, each of you have listed a host of barriers that different populations face, and I imagine that these barriers could extend beyond the populations you mentioned to having positive outcomes. Um, so since we're focused on repayment today, what are some considerations in designing or reforming a repayment system or elements of that system that we should keep in mind for dealing with um, different kinds of populations that might have different needs. And, and feel free to jump yeah, in. Somebody. Okay. Happy to start. So one thing that we've been focusing on is <clears throat> the uh, efficacy of student loan counseling. So right now, so the information barrier. And <clears throat> this is particularly important for students who are first generation, who don't really have that kind of family and uh, network that will you know, help guide them through this complex system. Right now, we have two points where students are required to go through counseling. And uh, the first is right at the beginning of their educational career, entrance counseling. And the second is right before they leave. Uh, and so what we did is uh, did a series of five studies uh, that looked at you know, we know that it's, you know, right now most students go through uh, an online loan counseling uh, tool on the department's website. It's perfectly free and it meets all the regulatory conditions of, yes, you, you know, did this activity. But nobody until we did really took a hard look to see, is it working? Is it achieving the original intent of the legislation? And so we did a series of studies where we actually observed borrowers going through the tool. And uh, we did this for uh, 75 students going to 12 different schools across the country. And the commonality you know, was really you know, uh, uh, consistent uh, throughout these students. And basically what we concluded was that students are making life-altering decisions with minimal understanding at a time of maximum distraction. That's not a good equation <laughs> for you know, good, successful student loan repayment uh, patterns. Uh, so life altering, the panel before talked a lot about some of the consequences. Um, the minimal understanding, they go through this online tool and Congress has mandated <coughs> their, that there's 28 topics to be covered in a 30 minute session. And that's a lot of topics to cover uh, in that amount of time. And the 28 topics don't really apply to every single student. So what that means is the tool has evolved in a way uh, so that it's very text heavy. Um, there's not a lot of guidance to it. And uh, students are encountering irrelevant information. When they start encountering that irrelevant information, you can just see it in their eyes. Even though they start it, they realize they're getting into something very serious and they don't necessarily know what they're 
getting into. They know it's important, but as soon as they start hitting that irrelevant information, they start uh, skimming, start skipping whole sections, and at the result, they're left just saying, well, if something happens, my server will contact me. And, you know, Sarah talks a lot about how, you know, the contact information is not real great. Basically, you want to empower these students through this process of counseling, and it's not happening. Uh, and uh, I think that's a real significant barrier, especially for those populations less familiar. What we need <coughs> is more robust student loan counseling. Uh, there's some legislation out there that does it. The department's made some uh, recent improvements. And um, uh, to the effect that students, like we've done focus groups where students are saying, these are at minority serving institutions, students are saying, so many people have done so much to get me to college, but once there, I'm on my own. And I don't really understand where to go. I don't have a parent I can ask these questions to. So these are the type of populations that really do need some individual attention. And right now, everything is focused on lowering the cost of the intervention. However, the intervention is not very effective. So I think some more counseling can have a very uh, large positive impact on repayment patterns. I agree. I had I had written that down as one of the um, things we need to think about is counseling both mm -hmm. just as they assess the portfolios or the complete financial portfolios of people when they take on loans, when they enter into college, what are their complete financial portfolios when they're leaving college? Mm -hmm. um, when we look at um, you know, students of colors and communities of color, they also might be facing issues of labor market discrimination, have um, underemployment or unemployment, and low salaries. So. Um, if you are in a communication with the servicers about your ability to pay and who might be able to assist in the event that you can't pay, I think these need to have open discussion and not like, predatory practices. As, as soon as you finish college, you know, a month later, you're going to have to start paying back on something that you may not be able to meet those needs um, in addition to paying all the associated costs of, uh, of your life, you know, of, of, of all the things that are... Um, rent, housing, car, all these other debts that are accumulating in, in young adulthood. So I think thinking about, you know, approaching, approaching graduates or even those who are maybe struggling to finish um, with a little bit more compassion and less predatory, uh, less predatory nature is, is also needed. And that's just not, that's not specific to communities of color. That's, of course, um, for everyone, I think. Mm -hmm. So we have a database of about 3,000 veterans that, uh, that have reached out to us to, to, um, for, for help. And one of the recurring things that I mentioned during my, my short presentation was that uh, veterans complain about having debt that they didn't want, need, or authorize. So I'd make a, a few comments about how the student loan process works for veterans and maybe how it works against their interests. You know, uh, when you attend college, the first thing that you're told is, you know, fill out the FAFSA, sign the master promissory note. It's automatic. Everybody does it. Don't worry about it. You know, I'll take care of the paperwork for you. Um, you know, we've heard from some whistleblowers that actually the master promissory note is, is uh, signed by, by the school, not by the veteran. I worked with a veteran who uh, attended uh, Brown Mackey Nursing School. Uh, after his first year, he went in and uh, said, isn't it time for me to fill out the FAFSA again? Because that's an annual process. And the, he was told, oh, oh, don't worry about it. We've already taken care of it. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think, you know, <clears throat> I think veterans don't really understand the student loan process. Um, you know, you, first of all, you shouldn't have to sign the master promissory note if you don't need a loan. I think one thing about veterans that's different from other students is that they come with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, the GI Bill is very generous right now. Um, you know, it pays full tuition at a public institution and up to a cap at uh, private and nonprofits. Uh, it has a housing stipend that's pretty generous. If you go to Columbia University in New York, your housing stipend is about $3,600 a month. So their need to borrow is much less. But you know, basically schools, um, you know, once the, the, um, the, the paperwork is signed, they're allowed to originate loans on your behalf without your explicit approval. They just don't hear back from you. And I think we've heard you know, from the loan servicers that you know, they send all these missives out and nobody answers the phone or, or 
uh, reads the email. And you know, so a lot of veterans tell us that you know, I didn't authorize that loan. Uh, maybe they didn't respond to the email that they got, but you know, then they get a refund because their account is overpaid because the GI Bill has paid and uh, you know, federal student aid is paid. And they go in, and a lot of veterans tell us that, oh, they're told that these are Pell Grants. They're not loans, when in fact they are loans. Um, so you know, I, I would definitely agree that you know, more education and counseling is important. You know, I, I was at Rutgers a couple of years ago and um, talked with the financial aid um, office there. And you know, I think it's difficult. You know, I think, what are there, 35,000 students at Rutgers? They have 40 financial aid <laughs> administrators. Getting one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling is probably pretty difficult and probably doesn't happen all that often. Yeah, I guess I'll second a lot of this. Um, you know, in the for-profit sector in particular, I looked at some data from the NIPSAS in 2008 maybe, but it had this one question about who did you talk to about borrowing or who did you talk to about financial aid? And at for-profit schools, you know, 60, 70 percent uh, of students were saying, I talked to the financial aid officer at the school. And community college students were saying, oh, I talked to friends and family. I talked to, you know, they had these other outside, you know, you know I looked it up on, on, online or, so, you know, there were these other options. Um, and for-profit students are, are talking to the counselors, the recruiters at these schools. Um, and I think there's a lot of incentives in the for-profit sector uh, to kind of maximize that aid. Um, and, and I think we could talk about that. We could also talk about, um, you know, maybe holding schools accountable for some percentage of the defaulted loan balance in that sector or something like that. Um, and that's kind of a, you know, long-term, you know, that's not exactly the repayment problem right now, um, but certainly giving better incentives to these institutions to maybe not over, you know, not max out everybody's loan or give them private loans from their own institution or tell them to take private loans. So we see a lot more private borrowing in the for-profit sector than in other sectors as well. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's a problem. So how could we design systems to, to make this work better for students? And when I think about that, I do think about, you know, students should know to max out on their federal loans before they take private loans, for example. That should be a requirement. Um, I, I love Sue's proposal of a payroll deduction system. Um, I think that has a lot of promise um, and we can kind of adapt to the changing incomes and, and students who are kind of in trouble would automatically adjust. I think there's a lot there. Um, extending those repayment um, periods uh, beyond 10 years. I think all of those things would, would help students in this sector. But we do need to look at this sector as well and think about the institution's role um, and how they're reacting to our federal student aid you know, incentives. And this 90-10 rule, we might look at um, you know, what are their incentives to recruit veterans and kind of maximize their GI Bill. And it doesn't count toward their, or their all kinds of veterans' benefits. Um, and it doesn't count towards their you know, loan limits through the 90-10 rule. So there's just there's lots of different incentives in the for-profit sector that I think we need to take a good good look at, um, and they will have implications for repayment. Yeah, sure. So I'd like to add a little bit, especially what Walter was saying. Um, if you think about something as simple as a student asking, "How much should I borrow?" That's a difficult question for a college to answer. Uh, you have this silo effect, so you can ask that question to the financial aid office and you're likely to get an answer that is very legalistic. This is what the law requires you or allows you to borrow up to the maximum of whatever. It's not really the same thing as how much should I borrow. I know that's the maximum, but how much should I borrow my particular situation? Uh, to really answer that, what is affordable, you have to get back to what am I likely to earn at the end of all this? And you know, we know that earnings really, uh, you know, everybody likes to see that uh, Census Bureau chart that shows the more you learn, the more you earn. And it's this real nice stair step, you know, very linear. Uh, what we did is we looked at that and we added in the 25th and 75th percentiles. You still, still see that same general trend, but you see a lot of variation, especially at the higher end. And so, you know, and those bands overlap in a pretty significant way uh, with a you know community college versus uh, the four-year degree. So a lot of that is being driven by your major. And uh, so to answer that question, how much should I borrow? They ought to be sent over to academic advising. You know, however, 
based on you know the cultural and educational you know background of the people in those positions they're more inclined to talk about well what's your dream you know pursue your passion and you know those things are important obviously uh, but they really tend to not want to get into the financial aspects of it uh, and they'll often like try to send that person to a different office and got to realize a lot of these campuses especially large community college campuses got many different they're sent over to these different buildings and so this you know student trying to answer this basic question has to go to different offices so one office they hardly ever go to is their career guidance you know office and those are people who can you know uh, maybe if they were lucky enough to get a decent answer from the academic advising about if I pursue this major what is the median that I might be able to earn uh, well, median just means have to better, have to worse. And so you can go to the career guidance and try to get a better sense for uh, what do I have to do? What extra steps can I do to better prepare myself for economic success than my peers? Um, however, not many people do that. So just a simple question, you know, how much should I borrow? You know, there's nobody really on campus that is speaking with a single voice uh, and is accessible uh, to students. You go to, oftentimes, you go to financial aid offices and it's almost like they have this Berlin Wall, you know, this, you know, very imposing, you know, <laughs> situation where they're right, you know, unconsciously they're signaling, you know, we don't really want to talk to you. Uh, we're not accessible. If they did, it would look like a, you know, coffee cafe or something like that. Come sit, talk to us, let's, you know, work this out. You know, it's not really set up that way. Um, so I think, especially the students that we have all addressed uh, are in a lot of need for that kind of more robust, you know, discussion. Well, let me shift gears just a little bit. Um, I think we've, something we've heard on this panel, a little bit on the first panel, is that there's a lack of quantitative data around a lot of the things that we want to know. And um, there are also not potentially going to be necessarily more quanti quantitative data coming in anytime soon. Um, so what is the role of qualitative data and sort of how can we collect data to better understand different populations' interactions with the repayment system? Where, where things are breaking down, where people are struggling, um, and what that looks like for people maybe different than your typical borrower. So there are um, some qualitative studies that are ongoing right now. I'm actually part of a pr uh, project um, that started as a longitudinal study of following students who um, were freshmen and is on currently ongoing. And now that they've aged out of, or if they've reached, uh, they've aged out of uh, post-secondary education, we're looking at how their, their, what their thoughts are uh, about um, student loans looking back. And so um, it's a small sample um, and we're still obviously analyzing the data, um, but um, it is, I think it's important because you get the attitudes around um, their um, a, a little bit more in-depth um, assessment of how they're viewing it post rather than um, actually have gone, having when they went through the process. And some, I mean, there are several themes, but one of the themes that um, comes up is, you know, the, again, this idea of financial counseling, how, how much, um, did, they, did they know how much they were going to take on during the process? And the connection, which you mentioned, with majors. So um, if I decided to go into teaching or, you know, or, or, um, or wanted to pursue a different kind of major, how might, um, how the accumulation of the debt um, changed one's decision making over that process, especially looking back, you know, with hindsight <laughs> at the amount of debt that they've accumulated um, post, post uh, Getting their, getting, their, getting their degrees. Um, so we have, I will say that that sample is selected on people who have actually finished their degree. Um, so it's a slightly different than people who have not or who have dropped out um, during the process. But I think it is important to look at qualitative data because you get a sense about, over, uh, uh, about what people are thinking um, having finished the process. And one of the, I want to say, one of the things that has also come out of this analysis is um, thinking about young adults kind of being the counselors for, for, for students who are going through the process um, because they have that insight and they have um, 
that on the ground knowledge of having just completed this process. And I find a lot of times people who are advising or talking about these process are uh, sometimes far removed <laughs> or haven't been actually, um, or don't, don't, don't understand what it is to be a young adult um, now, nowadays <laughs> dealing with the debt and the, and the problems that you're, you're facing with. You know, as I said, a lot of my work looks at um, family formation and um, decision making with regards to, you know, do I, am, am I going to have it start my family now? Am I going to get married? Or do I want to cohabit? And there are a lot of decisions that young adults are facing. On top of that, trying to find a good job. On top of that, trying to pay my debts. On top of that, trying to accumulate savings so that they may reach these markers at some point in their lifetime. And so, you know, discussions from people who have not had to make these decisions in 10, 20, 30 years um, might not be the, they may not be the best counselors. For, for, for students who are going through these processes. So I think that's where some of the qualitative work is helpful in, in, in helping to us to, in, to inform us about um, who, who, who we should be talking to and who we should be looking at and what populations we should be looking at to tell us a little bit more about what's going on. And just to add to that, mm -hmm. uh, so the peer-to-peer uh, -peer counseling mm -hmm. is becoming more and more popular these days. And I think breaking down some of that barrier uh, really is important. You know, just from, you know, you talk to someone who may be many years removed, uh, they can say, well, you have to make sure you're living frugally. Um, right. That's pretty abstract. You know, if you get someone closer to it, they're like, you know, the pizza place down on the corner of 26th Street, don't go there, you know, you know or don't go there regularly, you know, <laughs> try to learn how to make your own pizza or, you know, uh, <laughs> they can have things that will connect with you know, people more. Um, we're also kicking off some mixed methodology studies. Uh, we've got two big ones coming up, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I did one of these uh, many, many years ago. Uh, we have, uh, PG uh, serves as a guarantee agency under the FELT program, so we have a wealth of information about borrowers. Uh, and we've done logistic regression to really get a good sense of and pretty effective predictive you know value to these models but we wanted to find out well what's missing you know we only can say things about the data we have and so we did some uh, phone calls to these students and we looked at the people who uh, our model said you know should have been retained uh, but they weren't uh, and we wanted to find out what the story was and vice versa people who you know uh, so it was interesting. The people who the model suggested should be retained, what happened was they had not one, but at least two major life, you know, significant thing, like a health issue, and then they lost their job. Or they got a divorce and then ended up in jail. Uh, you know, there was these big major things. They could handle one uh, pretty well, uh, but two seemed to be challenging. Um, for those that the model predicted, you know, hey, uh, we kind of expected you to default on this. Uh, why didn't you default? <laughs> uh, those people, you know, had two different things that really stood out. One was they understood the system. They had read the material, paid attention during loan counseling, uh, knew how to contact their servicer. The other thing is they just had this moral obligation. It's like, I made a promise to do this and I will do it. Those are things that you aren't easily going to pick up in a quantitative way, but qualitative, you know, has a lot of, you know, uh, uh, potential in that. I might like to jump in and just say something I've been fairly unable to address quantitatively, because all my work is pretty much quantitative, um, is thinking about, um, you know, we see these patterns, what explains those patterns? And is it, you know, I've often kind of said, I think there's quite a bit of missing information. Students don't have full information. You know, a recruiter reaches out. They, you know, they don't really know about the earnings gains to different fields. They don't, you know, as all the, you know, they don't know much about borrowing, as we've said, that we need counseling and other, um, and other interventions for that. Uh, but like, what, what are the kind of key, what really is, like, what is, how do we identify those like missing pieces of information? and and kind of systemically, you know, is, do we need a financial literacy class in high school, perhaps? Or like, where are there links? Are there places where 
you know, do we need more information on college choice and, bar you know, we need clearly more information everywhere, but who is missing that information and why? And, you know, the implications quantitatively, we can kind of see, begin to see some of them. Um, but I think getting into that and exactly what students know and don't know and what sources they're using, I think is something that really um, would be great and, and needs to be answered qualitatively in this way. So I'd like to point out that uh, Sarah left out of my uh, biography the fact that uh, prior to a stint on, on the Hill, I actually worked uh, for 40 years at the Government Accountability Office. And um, you know, we always grappled with uh, quantitative data and qualitative data. And you know, usually there are shortcomings in the quantitative data, and you try to, you know, uh, perhaps shore that part of the study up with uh, some qualitative data. I've always felt that both are are important. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs has a uh, GI Bill College Comparison Tool uh, for veterans. One of the things that it lists is complaints the veterans have filed against particular schools. And the complaints are categorized into 12 different uh, types of complaints. But the, the complaint categories are sort of, they don't tell you that much. You know, like, I have financial issues. Well, w what does exact, exactly that mean? So <clears throat> one of the things that, that uh, VES has been able to do is because we have a, a database of about 3,000 uh, complainants, is to actually look by school and see what those issues were that, that veterans had. So, you know, I, I'm not giving up on improving the, uh, the quantitative data because I think, you know, th th there's some real promise there. Uh, but I do think that uh, qualitative data is, is, is also important, so. Well, I have a couple more questions, but I want to take a pause and see if we have any questions in the room or online. Carl Polzer, uh, Center on Capital and Social Equity. Oh, I got it. It's on. It's kind of a legal view of it. So I'm, I'm astounded to hear that these for-profit schools have no benefit. So if that's really true and can be, you know, there can be, um, there can be backed up with data, isn't that kind of a breach of contract? Because a whole class of people are going to them and they may even be injured because they're of the opportunity cost because they, they could have been doing something that would have given them a benefit. The other thing is um, there is a legal relationship. If most of them are getting their advice from university, you know, for-profit school financial counselors, there's a fiduciary duty there to the university that the counselor has, and there should be a primary duty to the student. So that's a big issue. There should, maybe there should be a system in place where they are given, and if, if you have a fiduciary duty to the student, you would tell them about the cost benefit of the university, which the people will not. And then thirdly, there's the sponsor, the government or the, the VA. If they know these things, they should be counseling people going in, you know, as a, as a, as a fiduciary for, the, for their flock. Those are just some legal questions. I am not a lawyer. Um, so I, I can't speak to the, yeah, yeah, maybe. Deanne from that, yeah. Uh, so I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak to the legality of it. Um, I'm an economist. Um, I can crunch the numbers, and I can tell you that some of the data we get from for-profit colleges themselves on job placement rates that they call in the field are really not in the field. They have, they make up sometimes their own data. Uh, so they might argue that their students are in the field uh, if they're a manager at Starbucks and they got some kind of MBA or something, I, you know, you're managerial or something like that counts or, you know, so, uh, so the earnings gains that we've been looking at, uh, you know, labor economists, I, I think I'm getting pretty close to a pretty good estimate using this kind of before, after and comparing that to other sectors as well. So we could also do this for other sectors. And we actually do see that community colleges, students, those, they get those bumps. Even for non-completers, community college students get a little bump in earnings. And we're not seeing that for for-profit students. It's particularly driven by non-completers. So some completers, this is an average effect. There's a lot of different schools, you know, thousand schools. You know, there's lots of schools. We're not just talking about the big 15 here. Um, lots of schools, these are averages. Um, some students, I mean, to be fair, some students do fine, right? So these are kind of averages, so I don't know legally. The recourse uh, it ha must be on a school-to-school -school basis. Um, but the way and, 
it's a way of thinking about it, and we think it's a more accurate measure now that we have this nice before and after, and we have you know, real earnings data from the Treasury, from 1040s and W2s, that we can look at, and we can say you were working at Starbucks before, and guess what, you're still working at Starbucks after, um, making about the same wage, and you didn't really transition into nursing. Maybe your nursing credential you know, wasn't you know, accredited, you, know, you couldn't sit for the licensing exam because the nursing degree wasn't accredited in your institution or something. So uh, I think it will vary institution by institution, um, but kind of on the whole, we're not seeing the same bumps that we see in kind of the other sectors. And it is, you know, gives, it, it concerns me, and we're especially concerned about these non-completers. So a question is, do you hold the schools accountable for just the completers as they're doing under the new gainful employment um, regulation? You know, are, they're kind of, we can talk about that uh, maybe separately, uh, but you know, the, it's, it's kind of easier to look at the completers and hold the schools accountable than the people who drop out. Um, and easier in a logistical matter. Uh, should we be holding them accountable for dropouts? I mean, is that a, that, maybe that's a legal question. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. I, I think I, we should, I mean, personally. But. Just a quick question. Do you have like a, a 30 second explanation of what gainful employment, what those regulations are? <laughs> Um, I just want to make sure everyone kind of... Oh, sure. Yeah, so the gainful employment regulations, um, they're going to hold for-profit colleges, um, all, just about all degrees in for-profit colleges, um, and then certificate programs in public institutions as well. Um, they all need to be accountable for um, income to debt ratios. They have to meet certain thresholds for income to debt ratios of their graduates um, in order to maintain their Title IV funding. Um, and that's kind of newly come down the pike. You know, the final regulation was, um, you know, put in place, I think, in 2014, and we're just starting to see um, uh, the, the impacts there. So that will change things in the for-profit industry, um, for sure. And, and like I said, I have some of these data from these for-profit program level data um, that I can look at now um, through this regulation, where they, sh they have to report on the program level outcomes of their students. And they're now held accountable for these debt-to-income ratios um, of graduates uh, at a program-to-program -program basis. So your nursing program, your cosmetology program, uh, so, so there are there is certainly big movement in that direction. Yeah, and we we use that information in our major choices tool, uh, which is just for Texas. But uh, we show you know for proprietary schools what the actual debt to income ratios are. Um, so getting that information out there is real important. I also remember you know it it may be bad now, but back in the '80s, I remember you had correspondence truck driving. Mm -hmm. Listen, and don't, you may be thinking, oh, well, internet, you know, simulators. No, this is before, before all that. They sent you cardboard steering wheels <laughs> and cardboard stick, honest to goodness, you know. Uh, so there has been some improvement. <laughs> so I'd, I'd, okay. I'd like to uh, address Carl's question and, and talk a little bit about uh, enforcement and what the Department of Education and the Department of Veterans Affairs are doing to protect veterans. Um, you know, I think everybody's aware that uh, one of the reasons that Corinthian was uh, forced to sell its campuses and to eventually shut down is because uh, the Department of Education looked at the job placement rates that the school was advertising and found out that in a lot of cases they were really grossly exaggerated and some of the same issues that Stephanie mentioned that they would count you as employed if, you, um, if they paid, it, paid someone to give you an internship mm. uh, for a day. Um, so, you know, the Department of Education really is stepping up uh, and, you know, um, ASICS, the accreditor for uh, Corinthian and a lot of ITT campuses, um, they're no longer going to be uh, allowed to uh, accredit schools and, you know, they basically were not checking up on the job placement rates that uh, the schools were reporting to them. Um, and when it comes to VA, I have to sadly say that, you know, VA is position essentially is they don't want to get in the way of a veteran making a choice. Um, there's a lot of talk about the fact that this is a, um, well, I can't think of the term right now, but um, that by, by serving your country that this is really an entitlement and that you can't get in the way of, 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 that, of that veteran's choice. And their, their basic position is that they just pay the bills. Um, you know, they write the checks. Um, and when they look at, you know, when they have inspections of schools, they focus on whether every single dollar that was paid was accounted for properly. And they tend not to look at things like, you know, is this school using uh, misleading uh, advertising recruiting to enroll, which is something they're supposed to look at. So. I think we have a question right over here. Yeah, 
I was wondering, um, a lot of the counseling that y'all have been discussing seems to be focused on, <clears throat> it doesn't seem to be targeted to the right people, I worry. And, and it, it also seems to be focused on like a reaction as opposed to a root cause. For instance, like, shouldn't we, before uh, in the prior panel, we talked about um, passively ushering students into the right program as a potential fix. So like getting them just automatically enrolled in IBR. Counseling doesn't really seem like the right move, like to counsel them into getting them into IBR seems like a waste there, as opposed to just getting them into IBR. Um, and other programs, you could say the same thing. And um, yeah, I just, I just wonder if that's, if that's the right, uh, if that's the right use of funds there. And uh, sorry, one second. Yeah, and, and what about dropout risk counseling? That feels like those are the people that need the actual counseling. Um, tracking dropout risk and then counseling people before they drop out and preventing them from dropping out if that really would be the wrong financial decision. Sure. So <clears throat> on the second part, I definitely agree. And we have been serving up data to allow schools to do that type of uh, target. Um, Schools don't like to get in the way of entitlements, and you can't compel students to attend those counseling sessions um, uh, because it would be getting in the way of their entitlement. Uh, so you have to conjole instead of compel, and uh, you know schools aren't real good at that. Um, but the first part, just you know, I mean, income-driven. In my mind, student loan programs work when students can pay them back, and if you put people in income-driven repayment options, you know, one over, you know, if they're not able to pay down the principal, they're gonna be paying a lot more over the life of, you know, that loan. So it may not always be the best option for a student. So I do think counseling is important, but I agree that it shouldn't be uh, narrow counseling just focused on sort of like the terms and conditions of the loans. I think, uh, trying to do uh, financial education has a lot of potential if it's done in a robust way where they understand, you know, I can go to college in a lot of different ways. Uh, part time, you know, will be more, it may help you get through uh, the initial, you know, payment, but over the long term, it's just going to stretch out the number of years and you're going to borrow a lot more. You know, so talking about how to manage your finances, I think is real important, and how to be a successful student. You know, all those things, getting back to the completion agenda of the department, I think is totally on, on track. I would add too that I think when we talk about like the nonprofit, I mean, sorry, the, the for-profit, the for-profit colleges and universities, there, there's a market for them because they are um, they're, they're feeding in these non-traditional students and particularly um, economically vulnerable or older, older adu I mean, um, adults or um, not young adults. And so as they start to either roll back, we have to think about where are these, where are these students going to go and what's going to be the market that's going to replace them, especially if, we, if they and we're, and we're saying the message is, is that you need higher, you know, these degrees in order to achieve um, or, you know, for economic mobility, to, to have economic stability. And so, I, you know, unfortunately, it's conflated with the fact that they're so expensive and there's all these, you know, they're, they're, there's these predatory practices that are happening and people are just taking out loans um, when they enroll in these places. But these, I, I think that we have to remember that these people are trying to improve their situations. They're trying to improve their lives. And so how, what's, you know, what, there's, there's a market for them. We have to improve the market, <laughs> not necessarily similar to, I think, what, what you were getting at with your question, thinking about, like, what do we do after if they've taken out these loans or are already in crisis? How do we improve the market for um, achieving degrees non-traditionally or for people that have dropped out or fallen away from the traditional high school to um, post-secondary education pipeline? So. I know that's not the, the, the focus of, of the, the talk today, but you know, thinking about when these markets arise because pe there's a need, not you know, um, how do we ensure that 
as they move through them if you have to pay for it. If we believe, you know, we believe that you, have to, you should be paying for your education, how do we do it in a way that, we, that they won't fall away and they won't hide from the servicers when, when, when it's time to pay up? I just wanted to piggyback and say I'm very interested in thoughts and working on research right now, looking at where do students go if schools close and after they drop, what happens? If, you know, are these students absorbed in, into community colleges, which seems like the, um, you know, an, an obvious lower cost choice with a lot of the same degrees, um, not all of the same necessarily, uh, not all of the same flexible scheduling, not all of the same, um, you know, childcare on site necessarily, you know, it might, they may not be similar. But I think what we're finding so far, results to come, uh, is that back in the 1990s and 80s, there was another, 80s and 90s, there was another kind of crackdown on for-profit colleges where a lot of them, uh, you know, they missed their cohort default rate um, uh, thresholds and uh, they were closed then. So we're looking back then and saying, where did students go back then? And things were a little different with online learning and, and whatnot and these big chains. Um, but it does look like a substantial portion, you know, a lot of the students who, um, uh, we're looking at Pell Grant recipients in particular, a lot of them who, whose for-profit college closed, we see absorbed into community colleges. We see this kind of shift into the community college system. Uh, now, our community colleges may have more wait lists now. They may be more crunched for capacity. Uh, there are other kind of problems that I don't know that this is exactly uh, equivalent to today's situation, but I think it's a really important question to think about, you know, if, if there's this big crackdown on these for-profits, um, you know, where do students go? How do they get this pathway? Um, and, and is that a pathway that um, will work for them? So. Do we have any online questions? Do we get? Okay, so just changing gears a little bit. Parents who borrow for their children's education, looking at things like the parent plus loan holders, often face unique challenges. What should we keep in mind when proposing policy solutions to make sure that they also include parent borrowers? Well, I, I, I think there's a huge need uh, to, for some sort of counseling for borrower, uh, parent borrowers, and I think the department recently came out with a counseling online tool for them. Um, uh, but still, you know, the experiences, the online experience isn't really going to be all that it needs to be. Um, but for parents, they are able to borrow very, very large amounts. And what we've heard from many is that they are, um, uh, you know, not really intending to repay those, that they just see it as, oh, I will sign this and the student will be responsible for it. Um, you know, that's a lot of debt for a student to take on. And I, I might add that I, I'm not a particular fan of parent loans <clears throat> because parents are not getting that bump in earnings. The student's getting the bump in earnings, right? So, um, so that, that concerns me um, about those loans in particular. Um, but I do think counseling about what these loans mean and what they're, you know, if there is a bump in earnings, by the way, uh, depending on the school you go to and all that. But, um, uh, you know, for most students, they will get this bump in earnings and they can pay back. Uh, their loans and and I, I don't know a whole I haven't looked at data personally on um, plus loans or parent loans so I don't I don't know a whole lot about that um, you know about borrowing in that uh, in those but uh, His, uh, more research <laughs> historically uh, those loans have uh, had real low default rates but once they change the amount that parents can borrow uh, I think you have many that are having difficulty repaying those especially uh, if their children are going to low resource schools. The, the question right up here. Yeah, we've talked about non-completers. Do we have a sense among the non-completers how many don't complete for various reasons? How many don't complete because they're academically unprepared? How many don't complete because they're not committed to education? How many don't complete, don't com complete because they have uh, family obligations? How many don't complete because they have one of those Crisis, crises that Jeff talked about? And then also, do we have a sense to what extent those factors are maybe different in for-profit schools than they are among the general population? I would comment that, that you know, one of the uh, common complaints about veterans not completing is because they've exhausted their benefit. So the 
<clears throat> the post 9-11 GI Bill benefit, if, if you qualify for the, the maximum amount, you get 100% of your tuition and fees, housing benefit, and book fees paid for 36 months, which is the equivalent of going to a four-year college. Um, you know, I, I think um, it's, it's uh, not that uncommon today for even traditional students not to graduate in four years. And so I think, um, and I think sometimes veterans go in and they're not quite sure what they want to study, so they may change their major. Uh, they may be, um, if they're um, in the reserves or something like that, they may be activated and uh, have to come back to school and, and you know, maybe, um, they, they, anyway, they have issues like that. And so I think that, you know, the, the duration of the benefit is, and the, the amount of time it takes to complete is, is an issue for veterans. Does anyone else want to jump in? Um, I, I have not looked at reasons. I don't have great data on reasons for non-completion in the for-profit sector um, that I can use in particular. But, you know, community college completion is, is typically lower than in the for-profit sector. So, um, you know, I think about 40% of students in the for-profit sector uh, don't complete. And in, the, in community colleges, it's actually a little higher, typically, um, and sometimes a lot higher. Um, and in one, you know, Judy Scott Clayton has a paper talking about pathways, um, kind of having clear pathways through your education program as being important. And one way that for profits actually excel, it's like you are entering, doing the certificate, here's the six classes you need, or whatever it is, um, and you go kind of straight through with this nice clear pathway. And something that community colleges have been kind of less good at is how do students navigate that? Okay, so they've got their English requirement, and then they've got this, and they've got their writing. Um, and they have these prereqs, and it's just not a clear, you know, they can kind of switch their major, they can choose, so, and they don't have this great counseling as we talked about as well. So whether that's academic counseling, um, not that the for-profits are necessarily doing a great job at the counseling either, uh, but that somehow, you know, the for-profit sector has often been, been said that they have a kind of better, you know, linear pathways um, to completion. Um, but yeah, does anyone else have other? Um, well, we did focus groups of students who went to for-profit trade schools. And uh, we actually were looking at the, you know, I'd spent a pretty fair number of decades uh, looking at primarily the for-profit, you know, sector and how that affects student loan repayment. Uh, so I wanted to find, well, there's got to be some good schools. And we did find some good schools and we interviewed uh, the students attending those schools, and it was real interesting that many of them had come from community colleges, mm -hmm. and they really saw a difference in their experience getting to what you were saying. They had a clear, more at, a, at the for-profit trade school, they had a more clear uh, educational path. They had a cohort of students that went with them. If they uh, missed a class, they got phone calls, usually from several classmates, hey, where were you? You gotta keep up with this. They heard from their uh, faculty member, you missed a class, we're worried about you. Uh, they heard from their uh, student services, you missed a class, what's the problem? Is it daycare? Is it carpool? You know, your, your car breakdown? We have a carpool that, can, that is in your area. They have those kind of resources available. Uh, and at, but when they were at a community college, they weren't getting that at all. You know, if they went to very large classes, uh, they were, uh, there was a class barrier between the people who worked at the school and the students, uh, where the low income working class people didn't feel comfortable interacting with their faculty member versus at the for-profit trade sector, you know, at a break, they go have a smoke with their instructor and, you know, <laughs> and they like the idea that at these for-profit trade schools, you wear uniforms, you know, just like you would at work. Um, and they said in their community college experience, people were wearing shorts, cutoffs, they didn't have respect for themselves. And they didn't really, you know, associate themselves with that kind of uh, more bohemian type, you know, uh, culture. Um, so there were some interesting, you know, ex, you know, differences in why they chose one school versus the other. Uh, but in getting back to your question, <laughs> you know, a lot of it is, um, well, we did a study at a, a community college and we compared those who had developmental ed, uh, so uh, remedial education, versus those who didn't. 
And what we showed was there weren't much difference between the two. That, you know, yeah, maybe they didn't need remedial education, uh, but they weren't far from needing it. Uh, and that they were all very low income and uh, they all had work full time. Um, so I don't know if it's like academic preparation or having sufficient time and resources to focus on your uh, education. Um, but low income people do go to school in a very different way than affluent students. So I think um, we're just about out of time. So if you join me in thanking our panel. Um, we're now gonna take about a 15 minute break. So in the room behind you this morning, uh, where you got breakfast, there's lunch set up. If you wanna grab some and bring it back to your seat, we have a really great lunchtime panel that's gonna start uh, right around 12.
Finished with our next panel, if you could finish up grabbing lunch and return to your seats. Um, I'd also like to welcome the last panel of the day to the stage. Uh, today's panel will be moderated by Travis Plunkett, who you heard from earlier. Uh, Travis is a senior director on Pew's Family Economic Security Portfolio. As head of the portfolio, he leads a staff of experts that conducts policy-relevant research on ways to stabilize and strengthen families' finances uh, in a constrained fiscal climate. Prior to joining Pew, he directed federal legislative and regulatory affairs for the Consumer Federation of America. Um, so welcome. Come on up. Okay, panelists, I'm alone up here. Okay, while our panel is uh, putting on their mics, I'm going to introduce them. And they have helpfully arranged themselves in the order in which they will initially speak. So um, just one note, I will not go through all of their bios, but they have an extraordinary range of experience dealing with education and budget policy and consumer financial regulation. So first up, uh, Pauline Abernathy, Pauline oversees national policy and advocacy strategy for TICUS, the Institute for College Access and Success. She previously served in senior roles with Philadelphia Mayor Michael Nutter, the Pew Charitable Trust, the US Department of Education, and the White House National Economic Council and Domestic Policy Council. Next, we'll hear from Seth Frotman. Seth is the CFPB's Assistant Director in the Office for Students and its Student Loan Ombudsman. He previously worked with Holly Petraeus at the CFPB's Office of Service Member Affairs and at the Treasury Department and with the Senate Health Committee, the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Jason Delisle is now a resident fellow at AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, where he works on higher education financing with an emphasis on student loan programs. Before joining AEI, uh, Jason served for a number of years as the Director of Federal Education, uh, the Federal Education Budget Project at New America, and was an informal advisor on higher education reform for Governor Jeb Bush's presidential campaign. So what I've asked the panelists to do is respond to an opening question for you know, three, four minutes, and then we're gonna uh, get into more specific questions and have some dialogue. And the opening question is, so we're gonna go from the more general to uh, the more specific in talking about policy and potential policy options to uh, help the borrowers we talked about who are having the most difficult uh, time repaying their loans. So the question is, um, given that under the new programs I spoke about this morning that the Obama administration has implemented, um, that deal with income-driven repayment and that a growing number of borrowers are taking advantage of them, please give us your assessment of what's working well in general with IDR, uh, what's not, what needs to be improved, and what policies should be considered to improve these programs. So first to Pauline. Okay. Yeah. There you there. go. Hi. Um, so before I talk about what needs to be and can be improved with income-driven repayment, it is important to recognize that there are now 5.5 million borrowers in income-driven repayment. And for many of them, it has made a world of difference. They're making either zero payment at all, um, each month if their income is below 150% of the poverty line based on their family size. Um, or making a payment based on their income if their income is above that level. And it's, for many of them, made a difference of hundreds of dollars and made their uh, payments manageable. We see data showing that uh, fewer in delinquency and default, uh, that of borrowers in income-driven repayment plans, 40% of them had defaulted or had an economic hardship deferment or unemployment deferment or had been in forbearance for more than two months. So many of them had been struggling before they enrolled in income-driven repayment and they have much lower 
incidences of delinquency um, afterwards. So it is working. Um, and there have been multiple improvements made um, in the last few years to address some of the, to further improve the program. Um, the latest repay program doesn't have a requirement of a debt to earnings um, ratio that you have to have, so there's no partial financial hardship requirement, so everyone can enroll in the program. Um, it's better targeted in terms of removing the standard payment cap so that as your income rises, your payments rise and they don't level off at a certain point, which was um, unintentionally leading to high income borrowers paying a smaller share of their income than lower income uh, borrowers. Um, we've also addressed an issue where how to handle the payments of uh, borrowers who are married and how their spouse's income and their income and each other's debts are handled so that it's much more equitable there. So it's better targeting of the program. It's simplified it by removing that partial financial hardship requirement as well. And we've also helped address the fact that um, for very low income borrowers there who are in negative amortization, their interest, their payments aren't covering their interest. And so their balances are rising. We've increased the, the, the interest protection there um, in the repay bro program as well to, again, better target those benefits. I think there's more we can do. Um, clearly, we need to streamline the programs. There are too many programs. Um, we need one improved program. Um, our recommendation is that there be one income-driven program and one standard pay payment program that would, that would have a different repayment length based on your total balance. But essentially, there's two pay there would be two plans that you choose from. Um, uh, we clearly need to do a much better job at getting borrowers who could benefit from these income-driven plans into them. So while enrollment has increased dramatically, we know there are millions of borrowers who could benefit um, who are not enrolled, and we need to do a much better job of getting them in. We clearly also have a, need to do a much better job of keeping borrowers' payments based on their income once they're in the plan. So as we've heard earlier today, this issue, uh, and Seth will speak much more, about the issue of the annual recertification of your income, that we need to automate that process um, so that we don't have people falling out of the income-driven payments that, and, um, and seeing their monthly payments skyrocket just because they didn't fill out that paperwork. Um, there is a bipartisan bill, the Simple Act, um, that was recently introduced that would automate that process. The other thing that bill would do, which is a key step we need, is to just automatically enroll borrowers who are severely delinquent into an income-driven repayment plan. Because while IDR may not be the best plan for everyone, it's always better than default. And once you're starting to be on that pathway to default, at that point, you should be in an income-driven repayment plan. And so that simple act of bipartisan legislation would also say, after four months of no payments, you would automatically be enrolled in an income-driven repayment plan. Uh, 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 the final uh, piece of our recommendation is that we need to make sure that any amount that is forgiven at the end of the 20, uh, 20 or 25 years currently, we think they should always be 20 years, that 20 years is enough. At that point, your children can be in college. Um, any amount that's forgiven at that point should be discharged without uh, worrying about a, a big unaffordable tax payment. And uh, so that regardless of the, the reason for the discharge, it should not be treated as taxable income. So Seth, we heard a lot about loan servicing this morning, an issue that CFPB has spent a great deal of time uh, on. So I assume your comments will focus to some extent on that. Yes. Um, so I think first just to take one step back, just to talk a little bit about the CFPB and our role. Um, you know, we're the newest federal regulators, so we always kind of feel the need to start off telling people who we are, which at some point maybe we Please won't do. have to do. But, um, so the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was created in the wake of the economic meltdown, where Congress realized, despite the fact that there were consumer protection laws on the books, there wasn't a single regulator in charge of doing it. Um, and as too often is the case, if it isn't someone's top priority, it often kind of falls down the list. So. The, the role and the mission of the Bureau is quite simple. It's to make consumer financial markets work better for consumers. Um, and that is in mortgages, in credit cards, in payday loans, 
lot of the issues that I know Pew cares about, but Congress also created a specific office to focus on the issues of student loans, which is the office that I have the privilege of working on. And over the, ca over the past five years now, our office has taken considerable steps as the primary federal financial regulator overseeing the, all of the federal student loan market. And uh, just to kind of tick off what those are, you know, first we've created the first uh, federal supervisory program looking at banks and non-banks of student loan servicers to see how well they are doing the job that they are paid to be doing on behalf of the Department of Education, private creditors, and ultimately uh, for the purposes of borrowers setting themselves up for success. Uh, and we'll get to this, and unfortunately we have seen quite often that is not the case. And our examiners now have identified a range of illegal practices that they have seen at those entities. Uh, we also take consumer complaints. Um, so if you are having a problem with your student loan servicer, your for-profit school, um, you know, we take those complaints and we not only try to help you get resolution uh, on the underlying matter, but it also guides what we do in terms of what entities we will look at or what policy issues we focus on. Uh, we've also now taken two public enforcement actions related to student loan servicing and more related to the larger higher education finance space where we've identified illegal practices and gotten considerable restitution on behalf of borrowers. And we also work closely with the Department of Education as we try to work towards more consistent rules and protections for borrowers in this space. So I think the two points I just want to kind of put on the table and I'm sure we will get to today is that um, you know, everyone knows the numbers at this point, $1.2 trillion of student debt, 40 plus million borrowers, and I think kind of all of the work I mentioned before kind of has led us to the unfortunate conclusion is that the considerable growth in student loan debt by itself is enough to really cause uh, millions of borrowers to be struggling, but the student loan servicing breakdowns that unfortunately are accompany that are kind of adding insult to injury and making that situation e even worse. So over the course of the past few years, unfortunately, the Bureau has now identified student loan servicing breakdowns that impact the full range of borrowers. So borrowers who have been able to kind of scrape together a couple extra dollars who are trying to get ahead uh, all the way to the borrowers who are struggling the most, trying to reach out and get into, as Pauline mentioned, income-driven repayment plans. Um, and unfortunately, what we have seen is that student loan servicing breakdowns impact all of them. And kind of on the flip side, not only is it impacting the full range of borrowers, it's kind of impacting the full range of the repayment life cycle. So everything from the minute you leave school and are trying to figure out your grace period till you know, nearly the end with payoff statements and every facet in between, we have seen problems. And unfortunately, it's really exacerbating um, the issue of student debt by itself. And I think the second point I want to make, and I hopefully our panel will get to today, and I think it was kind of touched on earlier, is that I think we, I think we need to improve the public dialogue around student loan debt. And I think some of the words we have chosen and some of um, some of the description of the borrowers who are struggling is unfortunately just too cramped. I think too frequently we see, um, you know, we take the word struggling and we kind of insert only those borrowers who are in default. And I think the Bureau has spent a lot of time talking to tens if not hundreds of thousands of people throughout the country and I think one of the main takeaways that we have, uh, we have heard is that even borrowers who are current on their loans uh, are really struggling. And I think when you look at their household balance sheet and whether that is driving decisions about saving for retirement or buying a home, uh, income inequality issues, and I think the list goes on and on, I think one of the real issues that I hope we could talk about and kind of why I'm excited to be here with uh, my researchers, consumer advocates, is I think a whole lot of work needs to be done in this space to realize the policy implications we have taken to essentially add eight to nine hundred billions of dollars of student loan debt in just a decade and what that means for a whole generation of borrowers who are left to deal with the ramification of those decisions. Thanks. Uh, uh, this, uh, on our first panel uh, this morning we heard a, a great deal about a uh, payroll deduction and automatic income-based repayment system based on uh, payroll deductions. Jason fortuitously has studied this issue from a number of angles, 
And so I've asked him in his opening remarks to, to mention that as well. Yeah, so I mean, this, this idea of um, payroll withholding for student loans has, has sort of been around for a long time. Um, and a lot of it is driven by, and I'm sure you heard this earlier this morning, about you know, this, is, this is how other countries do it. Um, we don't do it that way. Um, and I think that, um, I mean, and, and as we've heard, we have, there, there's, it's an opt-in system to use income-based payment. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork. You have to re-enroll on a uh, non-standardized date. Might be November 12th, might be April 30th, just depends on whenever you signed up. Um, so there's a, this, you know, a, a lot of focus around IBR, sort of the promise of income-based repayment, has sort of been pitched as a, a, around how much subsidy it can deliver, right? And so and how low it can make payments. And I sort of ask, you know, is that, has that been the right approach? And because, look, we, what IBR has been amazing at is providing very large subsidies to people who want to go to graduate school. Which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's overwhelmingly successful in, in that effort. And I, but that isn't what I think people had in mind for the program. Meanwhile, there are 8 million people in default on their federal student loans. 8 million people. And by the way, graduate students don't default. So, so it's very rare that they default, but here we have a big subsidy program for them. Um, did we really need that? We've got 8 million people in default. Um, and, and I actually think, you know, this is some of my thinking aligns with Sue Dynarski on this, on, on payroll withholding. Um, but but I, I, I think that the people who support payroll withholding sort of overstate what it actually can do, and they really minimize and don't discuss the trade-offs that are involved in, in, in that approach. Um, so so what, I, what I did uh, with working with Jeb Bush's campaign is we tried to come up with a way that would just make student loans make more sense in a way that we could actually do payroll withholding. Um, and what we ended up with was that they just shouldn't be loans at all. I mean, the worst part about student loans is that they're loans. Um, and so what we said was, well, let's get rid of the balance. Let's get rid of the interest rate. Let's get rid of servicers. That's, I mean, that's where most all these problems are. There's no more collections agencies. And these are some of the promises of payroll withholding. And what we would do is we would say, for every $10,000 you draw down in federal money to pay for your education, you'd have a total of $50,000 to draw down. For every $10,000 you draw down, you pay back 1% of your income on your income taxes for 25 years, or until you reach 1.75 times whatever you used. And that's it. That's basically the system. You don't need any more uh, loan servicers, because the loans are collected on on income taxes. Um, and we don't have an enrollment process. Um, we also don't have the same kind of system that Sue is talking about where this is like Social Security. I think Sue probably talked about we should do it like Social Security. You can't really do it like Social Security because um, Social Security is on wages. It's not on capital gains. It's not on interest income. So, so those, all that would be excluded. I always sort of chuckle when I hear a progressive like Sue talk about excluding uh, non-wage income from a repayment calculation. Um, so this, this was the plan, and, and it not only fixes the sort of the administrative problems of IBR, but it fixes the sort of moral hazard and unfair benefits for graduate students of IBR. Because IBR's Achilles heel is that someone who borrows five grand gets the exact same terms in IBR as someone who borrows 150 grand. Same repayment terms, totally unfair. Under this plan, the more you borrow, the higher your share of income. And, and the more you pay, right? So it's almost more like a tax in that regard. So I think that's a much better system and gets rid of all of these problems as opposed to sort of tinking around the edges of, well, uh, we can make the enrollment a little more automatic. Can we streamline the four-page form down to 30 questions instead of 30, you know, 35 and, and these types of things. So I think we need much more bigger thinking for the 8 million people uh, who are in default, and I think this would fix that. So let me give uh, all the panelists an opportunity to chime in or respond to uh, Jason's points or what Seth said on servicing or Pauline's initial comments. Uh, and I have a couple of quick follow-up questions, then we'll get to the next topic. Um, well, I th there are, are parts, I, I, I agree with Jason on the fact that there are 8 million people in default, and so clearly our problem, our, our system needs to be improved. <laughs> um, and there are many people who could, uh, uh, are in default, we need to help them get out and stay out of default. 
Um, the other aspect of the proposal he just described that is, I think, really important is the idea of capping the total amount of the payments, whether it be based on interest or based on the system he's describing, so that people don't see their balance increasing and increasing, um, even if they're being told, well, you, you know, you'll, you'll get it forgiven in 20 years, the stress and anxiety around seeing those balances and how demoralizing it is to see your balance rising even as you're making payments and making what you are expected to be making and you may be struggling to make those payments and your balance is going up. So from a budgetary standpoint, we can address that because the, the under the program already, that amount is not going to be repaid. It's going to be forgiven. So it doesn't cost anything to just put a cap on that because those amounts are already go going to be forgiven and not collected. Um, and so we should do that and give an assurance that you'll never pay more than 150% or 175% is your proposal. Um, uh, I think it's just you know, not the case that, that that IDR is not helping borrowers who have very low incomes who didn't go to graduate school and may not have completed since, for again, if you are making less than 150% of poverty, you're making zero monthly payments. Um, and above that, you're making a lower payment than you would otherwise. And likewise, how much you borrow does affect how much you pay. It may not affect your monthly payment, but it affects your total payment over the life of re, um, repayment. And so for most people, they are going to repay in full. And so it, it affects whether you're going to repay in five years, seven years, 12, 15, 20. Um, under the repay plan, if you have graduate loans, you net don't get forgiveness until after 25 years. 25 years. Um, so it does affect, um, and you know, none of us know how much we're going to make in the future, how large our family is going to be, what our partner or spouse's income is going to be. And you have to know all of those things to be able to know whether at what point the extra borrowing isn't going to lead to greater cost for you. And so in reality, none of us really know, you know what we will repay, what we won't. So any additional amount we borrow is potentially more that we'll be expected to repay, even under an income-driven repayment. So I think I just want to make um, two points skating in the middle of all of this. I think, um, in full disclosure, I was following the live tweet before I got here. And I think, um, I don't know if someone said this or if someone was commenting, but I think they noted that you're going to trust Twitter's, uh, Twitter's assessment of what was happening? I here? was. Okay, all right. That's, this, this, is, this is my disclosure. That's, that's fair. This is my full disclosure <laughs> effort. So I'm I sure think, it was accurate. Uh, it was from Clint at Pew, who wrote, you know, oh, people. Well, if it's a Pew, yeah, that's, why, oh, that's okay. why I feel really good about People live one financial life. And I thought, um, I was like jotting down all the notes I wanted to say, and then I realized that, like, summed up entirely and then kind of threw out my notes on this point. Because I think one of the issues that I think about a lot, and I kind of hope the people who do research on this issue think more about is, you know, the, uh, we're academics, researchers, even kind of government regulators too often are kind of siloed in their space. You know, we have a stovepipe of thinking about student loans and our solutions deal with student loans. And if everyone was paying back their student loan, we would probably feel better about ourselves and our field. And we're kind of missing the point that that is just one payment on these people's personal balance sheet. And I think to the extent that this stovepiping is driving underlying policy, I think it has potential for real damage to the people most at risk with the implications of those policies. So I mean, to the extent that our solutions are simply prioritizing student loan debt over all other obligations in someone's lives, potentially using the full weight of the government to do so, I think that has real implications and is also premised on the idea that there is a whole generation of people out there who simply have money sitting around that they are choosing not to allocate towards this obligation. Um, so I think to the extent that um, we are starting to see more and more research coming out talking about the challenges student debt plays in terms of home ownership, in terms of retirement savings, in terms of childcare costs. I mean, I think at some point we forget 
or we should not forget that this is a generation that graduated with not only historic amounts of debt, but historic challenges on the back end. And I think to the extent we are thinking about what the solutions are, we have to view these people as people and not necessarily just as student loan borrowers. So I think on the second point I wanted to make is, I think I am just fearful of looking at the distribution of IBR borrowers now simply because we have seen servicing breakdowns on a massive scale that unfortunately have impacted the most vulnerable borrowers out there. And I think unfortunately this ranges over the entire income driven repayment plan process. So everything from not necessarily having access to the information you need to know that these plans exist, which we're working on with Ed to try to resolve, to steering borrowers into short into you know forbearances because it's good for the servicer's bottom line, but not necessarily good for borrowers' long-term outcomes, to breakdowns in the enrollment process where borrowers kind of live in limbo and application abyss, which is our shorthand way of saying it, to, rehabil uh, to recertification issues about staying in these plans, to redefault issues. And I think it's just hard for us to kind of get a true sense about is this program working for who it needs to um, without the understanding of the servicing breakdowns of the implications of the people that I think all of us wanted to help. And I think that's where we obviously spend a whole bunch of our time and I think where we just have real concerns. So, so if I could say something, you know, since we're talking a lot about servicing and, and you know, like clearly you know, Seth has brought up one of the big hurdles here for, for borrowers who, who aren't paying or are likely to default is you know, sort of the, the complexity of this, the administrative burden, the paperwork, it's sort of an opaque benefit. There's also this issue, and I think Pauline is absolutely right, is this you know, 20 years is a long time you know, to think about repaying your loan if you borrowed eight grand. Right, which is like the median balance of people who default. Right? So if you talk to someone and who is in default and you describe to them the benefits of income-based repayment, you say, oh, well, you, you pay based on your income, you know, and if your income's low, your know, payment will be low, it might be zero. Uh, you know, the interest keeps going up, but don't worry about that because it'll be forgiven after 20 years. And, and they look at you and they're like, I'm, I'm sorry, what are you offering? What is the, what is the benefit here? Right? But if you borrowed 150 grand, Right, still 20 years, same terms, right? And you, it's very, you know, much clearer to you, like, oh, I see, I get how this works, right? And those are the graduate students. But, but the, but, so, and this, again, this is sort of this asymmetry of this problem where you get the same, you get the same, the, the same terms. Um, but, but what, what Seth can't do, and, and I wish he could, uh, given his position um, it was CFPB, is to talk about, so we talk about servicers as sort of the problem. But the servicers are, are running a program designed by Congress. Right? De it's designed by Congress, and it's designed by the administration, right? with all the regulations, their dear colleagues, the, the 15 different plans. Um, you know, Seth's talking about, I hear this a lot from some of the advocacy groups as well, and, and from like Danny Douglas Gabriel from the Washington Post, who was here this morning, about you know, servicers pushing people into forbearance. Right? And, and so pushing people into forbearance. But actually, the way the program is set up, the best option for borrowers is forbearance. Because it doesn't require any paperwork. And it immediately cures the loan. It doesn't require the borrower to do anything. So the incentives on the policy is for the servicer to put people in forbearance. Because the borrower is late, and they call up and they say, you're late. If I get you in this forbearance, you don't have to fill out any paperwork, I'm going to put your loan, I'm going to put you back into good standing, and your payments go to zero. Or I could put you in this income-based repayment thing. I don't know what your income would be. You need to fill out this form, sign it, send it back. Uh, and meanwhile, you're still in delinquency. I mean, so that's best for the borrower. But here we have all the advocacy groups and the press out there saying, oh, these terrible servicers. But meanwhile, when there, there's no criticism of the design of these policies uh, and, and the policymakers making them. So I think the, uh, the, the issue I would add on that which we hear frequently from uh, consumers, people kind of caught up in this mess, is, um, I mean, to be fair, I think the federal taxpayers spend a whole lot of money to have those companies uh, administer yeah. the law. So I think at some regards, we are paying those companies to deliver the outcomes that we hope they do. 
And I think the concern we always hear is, and then this is somewhat of an engaged argument, is um, to the extent servicers are able to make the case that it is just way too complex for them to comply with the law, the borrowers that I talk to want to know where then is their free pass when their loan is sent into collections and their credit is ruined because the system was so complex. And I think in some regards, I think a renewed focus on the federal consumer obligation of student loan servicers is healthy because I think in some regards, um, I agree with you that in terms of policy makers realizing where there are challenges with complexity is certainly important. And I think to Pauline's point before, kind of re-examining the system in terms of um, what actually makes sense in terms of recertification or access to IRS data is, is incredibly important. But in the time being, we expect borrowers to follow the law, and I think it is only fair that we also expect servicers to follow the law. I'd love to just, two things. I mean, one, totally agree. Congress bears some responsibility. The department, absolutely, um, that, that is why there is a big push to do servicing reform and to have enforceable standards, because it is unacceptable, and we can't be, we have to change the payment formula. The administration did try to address that by changing the financial incentives for servicers to address that. Clearly, a lot more needs to be done. Some needs to be done by Congress. Some can be done through private administration. We need uh, standard regulations uh, um, that are enforceable from the CFPB. That would be across all student loans. But my one word of caution, I mean, while we are a big proponent of simplification and streamlining, and we need to do it, um, we shouldn't kid ourselves that that is the source of the problems or the source of our servicing problems. If we look at the private loan market, the private student loan market, there are very few repayment options. Um, and yet the CFPB has found all the same servicing breakdowns, all the same servicing problems. So it's not just a function of the complexity. Um, it is, I would argue, uh, about getting the financial incentives right, making sure there are standards and that they're being enforced. Okay, now I'm gonna focus our attention on the borrowers we've heard about are, who are having the most difficulty with delinquency and default. Jason mentions median income for borrowers in default, $8,000. Median balance. balance. Or median yeah. uh, balance, right. Um, so run through the list of um, uh, potential policy options we've spoken about, and let's, let's talk about, for those borrowers, what is most needed, what is most helpful, and perhaps what is less needed. <clears throat> so, um, Seth, you want to kick it off? So, um, I think first is hopefully pretty non-controversial, is just better access to data. I mean, I think um, Pauline started by talking about the growth of borrowers in income-driven repayment plans. And I think we kind of um, have celebrated this with, from kind of this macro level, which I think it is good. I think we still have very little understanding of who is getting into this program, and I think to be frank, why? I think to the extent the large chunk of that eight million people are people who, um, you know, hear about pushes from the White House or you know, read about this in the New York Times, I think it presents a different, different situation than if the struggling borrower who needs this the most isn't finding out about it and not enrolling. So I think one, just better access to data is important. I think the second issue is um, kind of a more holistic view of the student loan marketplace that we have created. So, um, this is a market that has undertaken dramatic shifts in less than a decade, moving from essentially uh, the private sector, you know, um, originating, servicing most of the loans, essentially in consumer finance terms, overnight being a single creditor with the Department of Education. And I think there are steps that we could take that are simply legacy requirements that might have made sense under the old system which just simply do not make sense now. I think the one that comes to top of mind is the requirement that borrowers in a standard 10-year repayment make $50 payments. And I think you could kind of understand why that could have existed um, when it was like a private model, but to the extent we are 
worried about people who kind of have low balances but clearly have other economic issues, I think it raises substantial questions of kind of what are these lingering requirements that should be fixed recognizing the new, um, the new creditor model. And I think the final point is, uh, to Pauline's point, is getting the consumer protections and incentives in place. I think in some regards, to Jason's point, I think we, we are in significant trouble if a victory is incentivized to simply get a borrower off the phone as fast as they can. Um, and I can understand why they do it. I'm not disagreeing with that. But you know, I think what we've seen is these instances where the department and even private creditors have used incentives to theoretically drive the outcomes we want. So essentially, the federal taxpayers really want to do rehabs, and we pay for rehabs, and we've gotten many rehabs. And I think to the extent we start thinking through what are the actual policy outcomes we want, I think it, it is much more likely for us to better align incentives so the servicer incentives are aligned to actually get that borrower into the option that would be most beneficial for them down the line. So, well, the, the fact that you say most beneficial, is, a, is, is it, I mean, this is a huge problem. Is it's not clear what's most beneficial. Um, you know, so for example, if, if, we have a 10-year standard repayment plan. But if you've borrowed more than $7,500, you automatically qualify for a longer term on your loan, 12 years, 15 years, 25, all the way up to 30, depending on how high the balance. Um, and without an increase in your interest rate. Right? So in the private market, we all know uh, if you get a longer term, the interest rate is higher. The federal government offers you an amazing deal, which is a longer term at exactly the same interest rate. But that's an option that you need to know about and take. Right? And the longer term gives you a lower payment. Um, and we can't make it automatic, because people in the, in the policymaking community don't, they, they are disagree on whether or not that's a benefit. <laughs> Right? Is, is a 15-year term at the same interest rate, a 10-year term, is that better for you or worse for you? you know, and there's this argument over that. Um, you know, an economist would tell you, well, obviously, the 15 is better, because you can always prepay, and the interest rate is the same. But that's not how the rest of the, the community thinks of it. Um, so uh, you know, again, this is, this, this is what comes with the problem with sort of the options um, that we have, which is why I go back to get rid of all the options, and get rid of the loan balance, and get rid of the interest rate, and get rid of the servicers. And you can do it all through collections on your income taxes. What you would do under this system is, let's say you borrowed the $8,500. That's the typical amount that people default on. So you would pay back 0.85% uh, of your income um, for up to 25 years. And when you would go to fill out your W-4, uh, when, you, when you're going to do your withholding, your employer, and it would just simply ask, do you have one of these education obligations? And if you say yes, it would instruct you to increase your withholding. Uh, and then at the end of the year, you would simply reconcile, because this is now an annual obligation, on your income tax return in a very clean, simple way. And there's no servicer. There's no defaulting. Um, I mean, you could, I guess you could de default in the same way that you can opt not to pay your federal income taxes, which you, you can opt not to pay them. Many people do. Um, but we certainly have fewer of those people than 8 million. <laughs> Uh, and I think that's a, that's, a, that's a much better way to go uh, than, than what we're doing. We don't have to deal with what's the right option and how to design that. So just one quick point. I'll turn, I think okay. in, the world, uh, in, the, in the situation we have now, there is considerable harm, especially amongst this population, for borrowers driven to serial forbearance as, composed, as, a, as compared to be putting into uh, an income driven repayment plan. It's everything from um, the interest subsidy for three years plus if they're in repay. There's the protection against capitalization. There's the fact that they don't have the derogatory impact on their credit score. So I'm not disagreeing that we can envision a future way, but I think to the extent that there are short, there are problems in servicing driving outcomes that are particularly costly and harmful for borrowers. I think, you know, in the short term, that is what we are concerned about. But there, but there, isn't, there isn't like a lot of evidence or data that the people who are using forbearance are, are worse off than some other option, though. 
It's just a sort of like operating assumption, right? Well, I think if you took a borrower with even the $9,000 balance you mentioned, and you uh, say they called up their servicer, um, kind of were just like, I'm struggling, I'm struggling. Servicer didn't necessarily take the time to kind of uh, figure out what that borrower's financial situation was, got them into a forbearance, kind of let them go. I think what that happened to that borrower was while, while they would not have to make payments, their interest would grow, their interest would capitalize. When they started making payments again, if they did, their balance would be considerably higher. If the servicing interaction was one as like we hear, which is it is intended to be more of a, uh, a session in which borrowers were informed of their options, asked about their financial outlook, figuring out how long they would potentially be in this financial situation, if it was deemed that this borrower would be better suited for an IDR payment, they would make the same $0 payment. Their interest rate would not, their interest would be subsidized for three years. Those payments would count towards ultimate forgiveness. And also they would be protected from having their credit profile slip into delinquency and ultimately potentially default. So I think there are objective situations in which you see the short term steering or under incentives driving people to forbearance, which is objectively worse for borrowers. But, but I mean, think of, but think of the situation though. I mean, realistically, like the process that you, you're envisioning of a, the, someone on the phone with this borrower, like getting financial information from them, walking through all, all of this, you know, I mean, you know, the, 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 the kinds of people who, who do that kind of work in the rest of the financial world you paid a lot of money to do that because that's an expensive, intensive type of, of activity that, I mean, look, we already spend, what do we spend a year on student loan servicing? Was it $800 million? I think we spend $800 million a year servicing these loans, almost a billion dollars a year. And Seth is telling us it's not enough. It's not, a billion dollars doesn't, doesn't even cut it. It needs to be even more, uh, you know, basically uh, a really intensive service. And I'm saying, I, I just think that this, this isn't going to work. So I, I, let's I get Pauline in. Sorry. All right. I mean, it's a over a one trillion dollar portfolio. So, as a percentage of the total, it's a relatively small amount. But I would argue that I think we can do it better. That we're spending more time and energy on certain borrowers who we don't need to, and we need to be spending more time on others who do need it. And so, um, hopefully, we can get a bigger bang for our buck. Um, but as a percentage of the total portfolio, it, it's a, a modest amount. Um, I, I, just to further complicate the issue, I, I, it is important to also remember um, in the Senate Help Committee investigation of the for-profit college industry a few years back now, um, uh, this was in 2011, uh, you know, what they uncovered were the for-profit colleges were hiring companies to go out and find people and the contracts that I remember, particularly the Kaplan University contract with an entity, there was only one outcome that they were paying those um, contractors for, and that was forbearance. So literally, their sole job was to put those borrowers in forbearance. There was not to tell them about other options, because their sole goal was to ensure that those borrowers did not default in the first two or three years of entering repayment, and after which they didn't care what happened to those borrowers, because the school was no longer held accountable. Now, the trick is, borrowers couldn't be put into forbearance without the servicer okaying it. So they would either submit the form or get them on the phone. And so again, there was still an opportunity for the Department of Education to say to their contractors, uh-uh, that's not your job. Your job is to inform borrowers of what's in their best interest. And you can't just you know, take that. Um, so there, there, well, it's another kind of factor we need to keep in mind as long as we're holding colleges accountable for their default rates there is another player here um, at play. So Pauline and, and maybe Seth, I don't know if you can answer this since it's a, a question about what policymakers should do, but do you think we should do away with forbearances or make it a lot harder to get them? I think that we need to be thinking about making it harder to get serial forbearances. Right now you can get, <laughs> I see you definitely nodding, uh, you can get for three years, 12 months of forbearance over and over again. Forbearance is designed for short term problems. Income driven repayment and these extended repayment period plans are for long term solutions. So we need to, I don't think, make it harder to get a short term forbearance, but we need to make it harder to get long term serial forbearance. So, two thick things. I think one is um, 
student loan servicing, and I think all servicing, um, is much more than taking a payment and quite often an electronic transfer payment and kind of cashing that in on the right time. I mean, to be fair, we find out many times servicers cannot even do that piece of the thing, right? Well, um, okay. But I think uh, <laughs> we expect servicers, and I think they are paid to do much more than simply process payments. And I think part of their responsibility, which to Pauline's point, I think um, this is a question for the department, but they expect for under these contracts for them to be doing the uh, work to get borrowers into the repayment plans that their portfolios offers. And I think to your second question, which I think is a really good one, is, um, what systemic reform should FSA or Congress take to um, put these options on a more uh, comparable footing? And I think some of this goes back to data. I think to some extent we are hurt because we do not know the instances in which, you know, a zero dollar borrower, um, uh, you know, might income out like overnight. And I think there's some of this is policy making through fear of the really bad anecdote where we kind of let someone in and they go and work at some investment bank and they come back. And I think in your regards, I think there are interesting things that I have been told about that people want to do to try to put forbearances on a more equal putting with a zero dollar IBR. So if you know a borrower um, is unemployed, um, you know, or if you know that a borrower would have a zero dollar payment, um, being able to do that orally, I think, is something that is very fascinating. I think one of the main takeaways that I hope we have today with researchers and, and advocates is, I think, Pauline's point, it's, it's, a, it's an enormous portfolio with millions of people, and I think we, to the extent we are treating it as like a monolithic entity, I think everyone is worse off. And I think to the extent that there are intriguing things, to be fair, that servicers want to do to uh, make the process more equitable or help get borrowers into IDR, I think that is stuff we should absolutely be doing. So I'm going to throw another topic at our panel, and then I'm going to ask you all if you have any questions, so get ready. Um, so this, this is a big one. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but I, I'd like each of the panelists, if they wish, to tell us how to think about overall program costs here. As we've already heard, it's complicated. Um, a borrower enters IDR, they take longer to pay off their loan. Interest payments go up. Theoretically, the federal government could end up making more money off such a loan. Yeah. Then we have loan forgiveness. There are costs there. And other sort of uh, uh, costs uh, to taxpayers. So how do you think about and how should we think about balancing benefits and costs? Pauline. So I think. In terms of thinking about the cost of student loans, I think that's where we should think about the design of the loans themselves and their interest rate. Um, and we can do a better job of setting the interest rate to better reflect the costs of the loan program, not just the uh, cost of lending the money, the, the money and the, the treasury's interest rate, but literally the cost of administering the program and providing programs like income-driven repayment. Right now, it's, it's set. Um, while we've made progress in tying it to the uh, treasury interest rates uh, at the time the loan was made, um, it's still set with that T-note plus an uh, increment that really had to do with what was budget neutral for Congress at the time compared to the baseline, which was based on an arbitrary fixed interest rate. So it's, it's not related to the cost of administering the program. Um, so we need to do that as a result of that fact that it's set in that arbitrary way. Um, depending on interest rate projections, the loan program creates billions of profits or costs to taxpayers. So for instance, right now, CBO using their current scoring rules um, uh, projects that the student loan program overall, even with income-driven repayment and public service loan forgiveness, is CBO is projecting that the student loan program will generate $81 billion in profits over the next 10 years. So that's $8 billion a year. Um, so a lot of money. Now, as interest rate projections change, that can go up and down. And it just went up in this most recent August CBO report. 
um, but it can go and fluctuate. And so we need to do a better job of not creating those kinds of huge profits off the student loan program, off of students who, who are trying to get an education and struggling to repay. Um, in terms of thinking about income-driven repayment, I don't think we should be thinking about that. Uh, I think we should set the interest rates and the terms of the loan program based on what will cover those income-driven repayment costs. The purpose of income-driven repayment is to reduce the real and perceived risks of borrowing because one, getting education is not going to pay off for everyone. Even though on average it will, for the average borrower, there will be people who it doesn't. And so borrowing for paying for an education is risky. And we do want people to go into public service to be teachers and legal service, uh, legal aid providers. And so there are some risks we're trying to mitigate there. So I think we need to design that policy to do that um, and then set the interest rates and the terms of the loan on the front end in a way that will balance those costs. But again, it is intended to be a student aid program. It's not, um, this, there's a reason why we are funding this through taxpayers rather than just letting, leaving it up to the, tax, the uh, private market. We do want to encourage um, access to education. So. Uh, maybe I, I'll comment on, go next if I can. I figured you'd want to. Thank you. Uh, I had a so, feeling you <laughs> Well, so, yeah, and I'll be brief. Um, so, so Pauline, I just I want to put it to you, the, the CBO number that you cited, does CBO think that's the best number? Uh, CBO has an alternative way that, that economists disagree. Uh, uh, what is, which which one does that. CBO think is the best number? Which number does the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office think is the best number? <laughs> they they not currently like this other, but it's not the method that Congress requires. That's right. So, and, and are there any other places in the law that prevent CBO from using the number it thinks is best when providing Congress with cost estimates? I know of no others. This is the only place in the federal law where CBO is prevented from providing Congress with the number it thinks is best. Right. I mean, so, there's so this scoring so, rules. There's that's right. Five, this there's is scoring it, this rules is, for everything. So, I mean, there's CBO always they, has to. And right, and the scoring right, and they none of them specify how CBO should conduct its estimate, what assumptions it should use. This so is the Jason, only place. What, so, what assumptions should they use? So, I think they should use the number that they think is best, like they do for all their other estimates. And when they're given the freedom to do that, they tell us that the student loan program does not make a profit. So. So th this is a careful elision, I think, that Pauline has made by not incorporating this, that CBO thinks that that number is not the right number. But even using the numbers then, let's go and use the numbers that, that Pauline says CBO has, is officially required to report. Those numbers show that income-based repayment program costs about $13 billion a year. So it's an expensive program. $13 billion a year, that's the cost. Uh, and we don't have great numbers on this, but I would say that most of that goes to people who went to graduate school. Most of that subsidy goes to people who went to graduate school, which is an extremely regressive policy. I'm happy to have in here. So I think, i.e., to get out of the back. So I think two points. One, I think, so I think Pauline's point about uh, limiting risk to borrowers, I think, is a really good one. I mean, I think we saw a fundamental shift in the way we expect uh, students and families to pay for school during the economic crisis. So not only did we kind of shift more of the cost of college onto families, at the very same time, those families who could afford it least essentially had to shift that down through the loan program onto the back of the students. Um, but I don't think the incentives or desire or drive for educational attainment kind of changed anyway. So we kind of, you know, I think maybe if anything, it kind of got even more increased as the economy turned down and people were told, you know, a degree is a new high school education and a graduate degree is a new college. So we essentially, as a society, continue to encourage everyone to go to school and the way you're going to do this is take on debt. Just as always, there are going to be people who don't finish, who don't get the wage growth associated with it. And I think to the, the piece that is particularly of concern uh, to me is that the, essentially the promise made to them by the federal government, 
And I think some would argue the only promise made to them was, don't worry, you will never have to pay more than you can. And our answer to that is IDR. And I think um, why we have been so focused on the IDR issues is that these people have now been almost failed twice or three times, as many you want to call it. I mean, this, like deliberate policy decisions that these families should take on historic levels of debt to go to school, um, and a policy apparatus that said the answer for those who don't get the wage growth will be IDR, and then considerable breakdowns in actually overseeing the process by which that should happen. So I think to the extent of kind of why we focus on what we do, that's kind of an effort to kind of drive that all together. And I think kind of to the larger questions of cost, I kind of want to go back to my first point is um, you cannot kind of look at this in the vacuum of just changes to the student loan marketplace. I think to the extent, and I would encourage everyone, including you guys who do the policy making for a living, is to the extent we are moving away from a, ge a more generous program that helps grad students. What does that mean for their future chances of buying a house or buying a car or positively impacting the criminal justice system? I think to some extent, um, we don't do anyone a service if we view this in a silo of, you know, borrower student loan benefit the taxpayers in this, in this space. And I think to the extent, um, people would feel more comfortable with this general idea around targeting or you know, we should take money out of X and put it in Y. If there was a, a more faithful discussion about kind of where would this money go to when and how would that help and how would that impact um, you know, people's non-student loan related obligations. I can just respond um, to Jason's point about the CBO just because uh, there may be some people who are interested in the budget scoring was here. Uh, you know, Jason's right that the current staff at CBO do like this alternative method um, uh, than the official method. Bob Reischauer, who was CBO director, likes, thinks it's a better, more accurate method to use what CBO, the, what the Congress requires. So there are different uh, people uh, who are you know, equally esteemed who believe different things. And part of the issue here is we don't want the scoring rules to be changing based on who is the current CBO director. And so Congress did set what the rules are. People can have a legitimate debate about what's right, but it's not as though um, uh, you know, one clearly is the all CBO directors agree that one method is better than the other. So uh, uh, anyway, I just wanted to share that. All right, let's turn to questions from you all. I haven't heard a lot of discussion on, on costs. I just wanted to know what are you guys' thoughts on you know, free college, free tuition, or free com community college proposals, and how this um, impacts or sort of maybe solves some of the issues with student loan debt. Uh, and also, what are the, what is the uh, institution's role in providing free college and free tuition? Anybody want to? So to jump in very quick before they could actually talk about the policy. I think the main thing that we would want to reiterate around this discussion is if free college passed tomorrow, there would be 43 million Americans who wouldn't feel the impact and many of those that would continue to struggle. And I think kind of it's clearly our congressional mandate to focus on those people, but just kind of I feel like sometimes that gets lost in the conversation which so much focus on the front end. So before I get in too much trouble, I will. In the 43 million of the current borrowers. Yeah, current borrowers, yes. Um, and uh, and I'd say we've looked at off, uh, the data and what you see is actually borrowers who don't pay any tuition now because it's covered by grant aid actually are more often, t more likely to borrow, or borrow when they're low income. So it really depends on how the policy would be designed. Does it do it in a way that just covers the tuition costs of people who may already have those costs um, covered by by grant aid, but are borrowing to cover books and transportation and all the other costs. And so it, it, unless it helps them meet those costs, it's not going to reduce their debt burden. Um, obviously, to the extent it is designed in a way that addresses that, that addresses state disinvestment in public colleges, then it can help reduce 
future debt burdens and could be very helpful. Jason. Um, well, you know, I think that the free college conversation and, and, and Pauline is good to touch on this is talking about tuition. I'm not talking about living expenses. You know, and, and I always say, so the, the, but most people, most of the anxiety around college costs, many people don't necessarily realize is what they're talking about. They aren't talking about tuition. They're talking about the living expenses. All right, so for like the upper, upper middle income families who are sending their kids to a, a four-year college, you know, they have the whole cost in their mind, right? And, and um, median net tuition for families at a, or students at a public four-year college is about a little less than $3,000 a year in net cost. But the living expenses are about $13,000 a year. So the free college part fixes that smaller number and leaves the other number in place. And so for those that are think that this is some sort of solution for student debt, no way. And I, I can prove it to you. If, if it really were a solution for student debt, uh, Secretary Clinton's proposal would be to do away with the student loan program, because we wouldn't need it anymore if we had free tuition. But that is not part of her proposal. Other questions? Uh, yeah, so Pauline, you briefly mentioned private student loans. Private student loans have default rates very, very much lower than the, than the federal loans. And Seth, you mentioned earlier as well that, that um, we should look at, at student loan debt in the totality of a household um, budget uh, or balance sheet. Um, but student loans are, are, as Jason said, his research, they are different um, in, that, um, in that when you're, when you're dealing with student loans, they're not underwritten. You know, there's not an ability to repay tests in advance, except when the private sector does that. And so when they do it, they only make loans that they think will be repaid. Um, that makes it a very, a very different product. And so I want to, I want to get a sense of, you know, you know, you could say, hey, it's a public good, um, and therefore, if it's a public good through 12th grade, shouldn't 13th grade or 14th grade be a public good also? And 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 therefore, maybe government should provide it. That's for a traditional student. That's for 18 to 22 year olds. But the majority of people we call them non-traditional here, but that, the majority of people in higher ed are in fact not 18 to 22. So, so can we talk about this in a bigger sense about student loans being a fundamentally different product because they're not underwritten? Yeah. I, oh, I'm sorry. Did no, you want to no, go no, play? Go for it. Well, I mean, I think so. So this is my, you know, this is where I, I kind of, I probably am a little more left than my colleagues at, at AI on thinking about some of this. But, but I think if we're going to have a student loan program that doesn't have underwriting, right, that is open-ended, anybody can get a loan for any program, basically no questions asked. Um, and, and, I, and strangely enough, most people still kind of want that, that design. Um, I, then I think the repayment on the back end needs to be very airtight, which is not the system that we have, right? So if it's, here's a loan, no questions asked, and then on the back end, it's sort of you figure out this really complicated way to pay, and the insurance that IBR provides isn't automatic, right? And so the system I was talking about earlier makes that automatic. And so I, I think that that's sort of an obligation of policymakers make that system work much better and, and be more airtight. I also think this is going to be kind of radical, but I don't think the federal government should, should report to credit bureaus on federal student loans. I don't think you should make a loan where you didn't check whether or not they were credit worthy and then report to a credit bureau afterwards. I think that's really unfair and really terrible, and I, I think we should stop doing that. OK. Oh, sorry, Paul. No, I, I think that is a, a really legitimate point, um, you know, student loans are a form of student aid, um, and that's why they're not underwritten. And uh, when the program was designed, though, it was intended for middle-income students. Uh, the idea was that low-income students would not have to borrow. They would get grant aid because it would be risky for them to be borrowing. And we've now morphed into a system where more and more students are being asked to borrow. Um, uh, so. If we were to eliminate federal student loans and require everyone to turn to the private loan market, that would effectively mean there would be millions of students who wouldn't have access to college or would actually be charged a higher interest rate in order to take out a loan and go to college. And we as a society said, no, education is a public good and we want our society will be stronger and our economy will be better if more people go and get education and training beyond K-12. Um, so that's you know the reason and the rationale uh, for doing it, but that's also why we think that income-driven repayment is so important to have that kind of assurance that your payments will be will be manageable um, 
uh, and that there'll be a light at the end of the tunnel, and you won't be repaying for the rest of your life. We've got time for if we don't one final question. Yeah, <clears throat> just on the on the issue of uh, free college. So if there's a huge jump in demand for college, but the supply is constrained, that will raise the price of college. And we've already seen this possibly with 529 savings. We know that college costs are going up more than costs in general. So that would be one side effect possibly. And that if, and especially if Congress only went halfway and you know cut certain people in on it and others not, you might end up with you know, more obligation to borrow. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, gee, guys, I was really excited to come here and talk about student loans today and not free college, but <laughs> I'm back in it. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I think that, I, yeah, I, I, that sort of the, the demand effects uh, and, and the way it changes enrollment patterns, I think, you know, will, will be very large. I think, you know, if you talk to the people designing this plan, they have an, 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 an amazing amount of faith in their ability to fix all of this with different formulas, which is just sort of, which is crazy. Um, you know, well, we'll prevent this from happening with another formula. We'll stop the, we'll, we'll have a maintenance of effort requirement. We'll have outcome measures, you know. Um, I just, I don't, I don't have a whole lot of faith in that uh, to work. And I also think that, you know, the fact that, look, we're talking about free college for people earning up to $125,000 a year. I mean, I, you know, you, you think of all the, all the low-income families that, you know, might be struggling here and there for certain things, but we're going to provide free college to families earning over $100,000 a year? I mean, I, and this is coming from, from the left? I, I, I don't even know. I don't, I don't even, I can't believe it, you know? All right, Seth, I'm going to give you the final word. Okay, so this is a totally unfair pivot based on the question, but I think because he, <laughs> Go ahead. Because he sure you're right. I think because he mentioned the role of institutions here, and I think something that hasn't really come up um, is the role of for-profit schools um, in terms of driving the uh, outstanding student loan balances that we have, and I think um, something. So this has obviously been in the news, and most people know, and. There's been considerable focus on the very large publicly traded for-profit schools. But um, something interesting, the New York Fed actually came up with a series of blog posts or articles recently talking about um, a lot of student loan debt being driven by kind of for-profit schools outside of the very large names that we know about. And I think I just raised that in the idea of, you know, institutions matter, and I think I certainly do not raise that as if somehow student loan debt is a just their problem, which is unfortunately how this has been articulated. But I think more in the, there's considerable work to be done on the institution side to figure out not only if taxpayers are actually getting a good investment, but also borrowers who are kind of left holding the bag are as well. Okay. Please thank our panel. Excellent discussion. So Sarah Sattelmeyer is going to wrap up. I'm going to cheat here and use my computer. So thank you guys so much for being here today. I'm told that we were trending on Twitter in DC <laughs> and that I should be very excited about that. So well done for those of you who are engaging both in the room and online um, in our discussion. Um, I'd also like to thank you for just being here with us today and contributing to the discussion on student loan repayment, including issues in our current system, uh, those who are struggling the most, and areas that are ripe for reform. Um, as Travis mentioned at the beginning of the day, our goal was to bring together a diverse group of experts that highlight both the areas of agreement and disagreement in the field, and I think that we were successful in doing just that. Um, I wanted to leave you guys with a few takeaways so that, that were mine, but we, we welcome you guys putting yours online, emailing them to us, and continuing um, the dialogue we started today with others in the field. So first, uh, there was an agreement that the repayment process and problems are nuanced. For example, we heard that those with the most debt don't necessarily have the most repayment issues. Uh, second, there is agreement that the system we have doesn't necessarily match the reality of people's lives, especially with uh, respect to income volatility. So 
Um, I think someone on the first panel said that we have a system that was built for college graduates that have stable jobs. Uh, third, the national discourse. So the idea that there is this large student debt crisis that is impacting everyone may lead to solutions that aren't targeted at those who are struggling the most. Um, and as you can imagine and heard um, on many of our panels, there wasn't necessarily agreement on next steps. Um, but the panels did largely focus on solutions for those who, were ne who needed them the most. So we heard a lot about the pros and cons of auto IBR and IBR in general, the need for plans that simplify the process, uh, the implications of non-completion, barriers faced by veterans, communities of color, those in for-profit institutions, issues faced by servicers and by borrowers dealing with servicers, um, and loan counseling. We also heard about needing more data, both quantitative and qualitative, um, about those who are struggling the most to understand where the breakdowns are happening in the repayment system and specifically what their problems are. Um, and then there was also disagreement around whether and to what extent having student debt impacts other milestones in people's lives. Um, so we're really excited about the new work that's coming out from many of our panelists and others in the field that address some of the issues raised today, such as uh, what regulations and rules have a place and no longer have a place in the repayment system, how do we best protect consumers, and finally, um, what are the longer-term impacts on family balance sheets of having this debt? So thanks again. Um, please join me in thanking all of our panelists throughout the day, and have a lovely afternoon.